Hey everybody, welcome to the Wizard451 2020 Game of the Year podcast. Uh, I'll be your host today, uh, Wizard, uh, and if you guys want to go through the list, uh, we'll just go in the order of our, our Discord call here. Uh, you can introduce yourselves and let people know what you're up to and uh, where they can find you. How about, how about you uh, start us off there, Mr. Rhino? Um, <laughs> Uh, 2020 sure has been a year all right (laughs) is that your name yeah (laughs) you're supposed to introduce yourself on your youtube channel (laughs) no i don't care about my youtube channel i'm dying (laughs) you'll never get you'll never get subscriber at this rate yeah that that's ak rhino you you can find him at ak rhino on youtube uh links in the description below uh next up Go ahead and introduce yourself for me, sir. Um, uh, Daniel, uh, 2020 has been a year. I've stayed mostly at home, uh, and I usually stay mostly at home, so my lifestyle hasn't changed whatsoever from it, thankfully. And I'm Zach. I've played at least three games this year, so I'm legally qualified to be in this podcast right now. Yeah, that that was the only requirement. You had to play three video games. Yeah. Of course, none of those was Sonic Spinball, right? Just wanted to make sure. I did actually play Sonic Spinball this year. Multiple times. Oh my, multiple times? Multiple times have I opened up and played Sonic Spinball this year. (sighs) Is that like the, that's like the arcade, not the, it's like the pinball cabinet. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, it's it's the pinball pinball Sonic game. game. Yeah. What are you, yeah, are you yeah, like yeah. trashing him for playing one of the best Sonic games of all time? Or... <laughs> Sonic Spinball? Yeah. <laughs> That's a dangerous bridge you're crossing. Yeah. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and get this out of the way. Uh, game of the year is, in fact, Sonic Spinball. I'm going to go make sure you pick that up on. Uh, I bet it's, it's on like Steam. It's like five bucks. I bet it's on Steam. Would you like to lead us off with it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we're going to go through um, essentially our top three games this year, starting at number three. Uh, and we'll just kind of briefly discuss how we felt about them, and we'll talk about them as a group. Uh, and then we'll we'll have, I'll have some questions for us in between. So to start off, uh, I want to talk about my third favorite game I played this year, uh, which was Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. Uh, if for whatever reason you have not heard of it, it's essentially the only big title Nintendo decided to release this holiday. Uh, it is the sequel to... Hyrule Warriors and the prequel to Breath of the Wild. Uh, So it kind of took Breath of the Wild and merged it with the kind of Hyrule Warriors combat system in a really interesting way. And I ended up really enjoying it. I I like no life that game. Like I would play like 18 hours a day, it felt like. Mad man, absolute mad lad. Yeah, so uh, that game was really good actually. I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I did not expect another game to be able to capture Breath of the Wild's, like, level of exploration and, like, that excitement of, like, finding new things. And I absolutely did not expect it to be a Dynasty Warriors game that did that. But, like, the way that they merged those two, like, completely different, like, games and systems together uh, honestly just blew me away. I think they did a fantastic job with it. Uh... I would honestly, I'm honestly more impressed by the way the combat matches up with Breath of the Wild, considering mm-hmm. that game had a very like improv- uh, improvisational combat uh, style, where you can just do just about anything, like blow stuff up, drop rocks on people, and things like yeah. that. Yeah. And somehow matching that sort of combat with cause and effect with a Muso game like that. Yeah, it, I, it's really interesting. Yeah. It was really cool because I thought it would play more like the original Hyrule Warriors, um, but it's a lot more like Breath of the Wild than I thought it would be, and I was really pleasantly surprised by that. Mm-hmm. It was a little off-putting to me at first, uh, as someone who's put so much time into Hyrule Warriors, but I, I kind of have found like through playing it as long as I have that those differences from the original like make for just so such a much more interesting and unique experience that I, I really enjoyed and as you said like the stuff that they've taken from breath of the wild feels like right at home in a muso game somehow like casting uh, using the fire ice and lightning rods and like their effectiveness changing with uh the environments so, like if it's raining your ice rod and thunder rod will be stronger but the fire rod will have a much smaller smaller range just yeah. all, all the unique interactions like that it was 
really cool seeing all those systems and like essentially coming together from Breath of the Wild and seeing how they implemented that. And as you said, with like all these runes now available, like these characters' movesets have been like made even more diverse and unique. Every single character has like a special ability you can use with ZR. There's four different rune attacks, which are unique between every fighter. Uh, you've got your three elemental rods, and of course you've got like all of your regular Muso YNX combos. Uh, there are less fighters than there are in Hyrule Warriors, but like the differences between them all and how differently they all feel is mind blowing. And I also felt like the quality was a lot higher. There were definitely yeah. in the original some characters that I absolutely hated. Well, there's some characters. I haven't gotten all the characters yet because I haven't gotten far enough um, in the new Hyrule Warriors, uh, Age of Calamity. Mm -hmm. But uh, definitely there are some characters that I don't like. Hestu, for one. I don't like playing as Yeah, not, not a fan of Hestu at all. But most every other character I've gotten is pretty fun. Rivali's a bit weird, but he's still interesting. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of characters like Rivali that have like really interesting gimmicks. Like Rivali has two different movesets depending on whether or not he's flying around, and he's the only character who can like essentially fly. It it just he plays very differently. I, I love just how different everyone feels. Uh, especially in the original Hyrule Warriors, everyone had different combos, but essentially you would be playing the exact same way, but like with Urbosa, you're trying to keep up your lightning meter by like timing things correctly, and uh, Sidon's pretty similar too, with like trying to extend your strong attacks by pressing ZR at the right time, or Volley, you're trying to stay in the air and kind of juggle people. It's, it's really interesting how they kind of brought all those details together. And yeah. plus it, it gave us like a real story for Breath of the Wild, compared to like the original Breath of the Wild story, which was kind of subpar in my opinion. Really? I actually liked it. Yeah. Uh, because I've, I've always been saying this since that game came out, it's a lot more like the first Zelda game, where they give you some story at the beginning, and uh, everything else is just like, you're in the game, and that is the story. Mm. It, it makes for a really good experience, but like on paper, I don't think that the narrative it tells is super interesting. Um, I, I think uh, it does kind of has that issue where like a lot of the cool stuff they mention or characters they bring up are like don't appear often. Like the champions are kind of like l much more limited in their roles as characters in Breath of the Wild compared to something like Age of Calamity. Um, it, it just it, it felt to me when I played Breath of the Wild that like there was just enough there for an interesting story, but it kind of left me wanting more rather than like feeling like like I learned a completed tale so it's it's interesting now that with breath of the wild and age of calamity that story is kind of now feels finished to me in a way yeah and there is another breath of the wild too to look out for but mm -hmm. we've only gotten one teaser for it yeah and we don't know anything about it so far uh, wrong we know that uh zelda now has short hair so yeah and it looks a lot yeah. better there you go see <laughs> But we'll get in more into stuff like that when we talk about kind of what's coming up next. Uh, so I'll go ahead and pass the mic over to my main man, Rhino, if you want to go ahead and talk about what your third favorite game of the year was. Uh, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Um, I think my third favorite would have to be Splunky 2. I oh, mean... I'm so glad that you that someone brought it up because it, it did not, it barely did not make my list, but I would feel so bad if I didn't have the chance to talk about it. Listen, um, I just felt wrong if I didn't put it on. It's kind of how I started my channel. It was like the first thing I uploaded, I think. Uh, Splunky 2 is just fun, I think. Uh, I mean, you forced me to play like a lot of Splunky 1 uh, just a long time ago. I remember, you, you, what, do you own it like five times or something stupid? Yeah, I, I own Splunky on about pretty much everything under the sun. I think I own a PlayStation Vita copy as well, despite not owning a Vita. <laughs> Why would you do that, though? I think it came with, like, the PlayStation 3 version or whatever. That's fair. Oh, okay. That, no, that makes sense now. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't even own Splunky 1, but I played enough of it with you to realize it's a fun game. So when you told me they were making a second one, I was like, yeah, I'm definitely going to pick that up. 
and unfortunately the online was not available at launch but you know it's it's there now and it's, yeah um, it's definitely something honestly i think that was the real big thing that prevented me from putting it on my list just mm. the fact that like in this kind of year like the biggest thing to me was like play i love playing spelunky with other people um, and especially because this one was new and kind of it's always a little bit more difficult when you're learning a new roguelike i think playing it with more people is a little bit easier uh, and the fact that the online just wasn't there at the beginning was super de devastating especially considering how hard it is to get you know people together these days mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's there now um which is nice but yeah i can understand the delay because they wanted to do cross-platform but it's only on two platforms as of right now of playstation 4 and pcs and i don't think a lot of people interchange and play on those two consoles <laughs> it is coming to the switch though next year yeah it's coming to the switch but it's like another year yeah it's, it's in the summer um so i'm hoping at least that will probably give it another like you know boost so it has a bit of a longer life i i, I feel like spelunky and spelunky 2 to an extent are relatively mainstream i mean like i i feel like spelunky is probably not a household name but i feel like it's relatively well known if you know what a lurg like is you you know it's Spelunky. yeah I, I feel that's like, yeah. like that's yeah. like the that's yeah. like one of the name brand games along with isaac mm -hmm. so yeah so but I, I would always love to see that series get more people playing it and more recognition i would recommend it i think having a delayed launch on the switch oh well, i say delayed launch but i don't know what their initial plans were mm. it may actually help just like bring the game like a second life just yeah like, which i'm really hoping for because i think that's like one of the reasons why like games are released on different platforms like years later because they're just forgotten after like a year or even just a few months because like Splunky is like a great game and I feel like I'll probably come back to it like every once in a while even like when we beat the game eventually <laughs> yeah I, I think another reason why it didn't make my list even though I, I absolutely adore it is um and th this is not a bad thing whatever Splunky 1 was a fantastic roguelike and Splunky 2 does not change up that formula very much but like not I don't mean that in a bad way, uh, like absolutely not. It, it knows what it did really well, and it kind of changes that formula up a little bit and adds some new interesting elements, but it, it, it largely is very similar to the first game, uh, which I, I think is a strength personally, but... No, I, yeah. I would agree. Yeah, I'd agree with that as well. I think it um, plays very closely to the first game, which is good because anyone who can play Splunky 1 can play Splunky 2. But there's definitely like um, a large amount of elements that are new enough to both be frustrating because you're not familiar with them, but also enjoyable because it's something new to learn. Um, a personal example of mine are the fucking moles in uh, <laughs> abysmal in, in the first area. Thing. They just pop out of the wall and I, you know, I personally, I've grown to hate the lizards a whole lot more. That's just true. Because yeah. I even even though i know exactly like how they work um not exactly but i know relatively how they work i feel like i still get hit by them every right. time it's because you're too ambitious you think that's just a stupid lizard i'm gonna yeah right yeah, he's just gonna roll at me and just jump over it yeah a strength of splunky has always been like kind of growing knowledge of like over and over as you like slowly go through like playthrough after playthrough uh and i thought going into splunky 2 with all my knowledge of splunky 1 would help me but definitely in the beginning i feel like it hurt me more than anything purely because i was like i know how this shit works i would just get my ass eaten on one one every time yeah very disappointing dwelling's hard dude i yeah. do not put it against you i i think especially with the like the at with them adding lizards and moles to dwelling it it just makes dwelling even more deadly yeah so, some of the traps that were like deadly in like the jungle or like the temple are now just like chilling in one one mm. yeah it's very nice i think it's good though it grabs uh, and plus it's for much more forgiving as well like there's the spike traps that were lethal in um splunky one with those totems and stuff and now they're in mm -hmm. splunky two and earlier levels but they're not lethal anymore and yeah like yeah and stuff. It, it still does a, an absolutely fantastic job of teaching you like and preparing you for later like the fact that the lizards roll around and damage you is exactly how the first mini boss functions mm -hmm. um i i mean it's it's 
really well built to kind of teach you things especially because the, those spike traps do come back later in a level so like if you're dodging the punching tiki's just fine then, then you should be good to go with the uh, spike traps yeah exactly yeah i i also i'm not i wasn't sure how you guys felt about this but i, I really liked that it took kind of a it, it started adding a bit of like lore to spelunky like characters had like definitive like origins and like parents because uh, like the main character you start out with is like the child of two of the characters from the first game uh I, it was just interesting seeing like the passage of time affect these like kind of random yeah. like no name characters like i think they literally just were named by their color in the first blunky or something i i don't know i like, think there was some there was some lawrence Blunky one right because they still had the journal entries mm -hmm. yeah yeah I think I think it was a nice just like the the standard sort of like lore progression that mm, you should have yeah, for yeah. like a simple game like that. There's just a nicer level of detail that makes me more interested, mm. especially because it, Spelunky one, as far as I'm aware, didn't have any sort of NPCs, which is a, a new thing that Spelunky two added with like um, the monster, the like monster hunter that'll kill Dracula for you, and the thief that asks you to raid Madame Tusk, and the Madame Tusk and all of her goons. Hmm. Mm -hmm. that's true we only had like the bomb guy in spelunky one really mm -hmm. right yeah or the tunnel guy whatever his name was tunneler mm -hmm. yeah tunnel man tunnel man tunnel he's man. a playable character this time around as well which is super cool nice yeah and i haven't gotten far enough in that game yet. um i've learned that i'm belligerently bad at it single player but i'd definitely yeah. suggest playing it multiplayer especially with the new update to ghost um allowing you to freeze enemies yeah which is yeah, super nice true. Uh, I, I, I thought it would be broken and it's definitely saved our asses but it the game is still just as unforgiving as ever mm. yeah yeah, yeah, there's, there's like that compensation right there's like those punching bags and, and uh dwelling now but now you can freeze enemies so mm, yeah so it, yeah if you haven't if at this point you're remotely interested in it i i can't recommend it enough especially with everything going on uh it's hard to get people together i think splunky 2 is a really great game to just like hop online now that it's available at least and play with some pals because it's it's a really cool experience yeah no matter what platform you're on that's the great thing i wish more games had like cross platform and i know there's mm -hmm. kind of been like more games doing cross platform but i just wish there was more yeah i, I feel like we've seen a bigger push for that this uh this year and in recent years in general which is i think mm -hmm. is a really cool positive i'm hoping that continues in 2021 yeah uh, Mr. Daniel, do you want to take us to the next game? Uh, yeah, sure. I don't think anyone else probably has touched it, though. Um, uh, it's just a nice, feel-good game that I really like called uh, Hard Space Shipbreaker. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's essentially just a game where you float around in space. You're, you're trying to get off world, I'm pretty sure is the lore behind it. Uh, and so you go into like a billion-dollar debt with a company who hires you on uh and the agreement is that once you fill out that debt you are able to leave earth essentially um but there's all a bunch of tricks and stuff like that every time you go out uh to break down a ship uh you have to quote unquote rent your like cutter and your um gravity gun and your suit and helmet from the uh, uh from the company every single time which increases your debt uh you technically have to buy the ship i'm pretty sure every single time or you rent out you rent out a section where you can take apart the ship take um the ship. Yeah, but that's all just story stuff. Um, and honestly, the the price, like the billion dollars, quote unquote, that you're supposed to um, get rid of, is more of a um, like an overall goal to have rather than a major part of the game so far. It is an early access right now. Um, gotcha. So there's that. Um, but it's just a very cathartic game. Uh, and pretty much everything's destructible. And I think that's the that's the major appeal of it for me um, because you can look at it from any angle uh, on how to take apart a ship. There are various like load bearing sections that you want to like keep for that make it satisfying because you can just sort of uh, chop up big chunks of the ship at a time. There'll be uh, large parts of the walls or the outer casing of the ship, the hull, I suppose. Where you just chop off and you'll just have big chunks that you deliver off to uh, an incinerator or a reclamation area that sort of recycles the material, mm -hmm. um, which is very which is very fun. Um, Beyond that, each material that you recycle has to go to a specific place as well. Sometimes, uh, like for computers, uh, you don't want to you don't want to have to like incinerate those or recycle all the materials. You can just install it on a new ship. So, in some derelict ship, you just rip off the pieces and put it in a barge somewhere. 
Um, but I think the main draw for it for just an average person is that uh, each shift is divided up into 15 minute uh, intervals. So after 15 minutes, uh, the game kicks you out of the section so that way you can essentially do a score. Um, and I guess that's sort of a competitive aspect um, for it amongst all players. So you can see how much part of the ship you can take apart in 15 minutes. Um, the first starting ship, you could probably feasibly do that if you're good enough at it. But then they have larger ships called, uh, what are they called? I think they're called Geminis. Um, they're called geckos, that's what they're called. Um, they're massive things, and I believe they're um, coming out with more, if not already. Um, yeah, and they just have their own bits and pieces that get increasingly more difficult. Uh, there are lethal sections where if you don't handle the reactor in a proper way, it'll go into meltdown uh, and blow up the ship, Oof. and you'll lose a shit ton of profit as a result. Um, but with those 15 minute intervals, there's like everything's very non committal. So if you have 15 minutes to spare, you can just spend 15 minutes trashing some ship for all that mattered it, it uh, sounds simultaneously like s- perhaps a, a bit stre- stressful but also like relaxing in sort of a cathartic way yeah because you're in zero g as well you control like the camera and all different mm-hmm. shapes um nothing's stopping you from just eating the ship out into space either because I mean, again it's not attached to anything it's just in zero g mm-hmm. um as you um, upgrade your gravity gun, which is what you use to move materials around, you could easily do stuff like that. There have been portions where um, I was running out of time and I was like, fuck it. Instead of taking off all of the aluminum, which uh, the game prefers to recycle rather than incinerate, um, I just fucking grabbed all the material together, hooked it all up, and just yeeted like half a ship into the incinerator. Uh, just so I can get five minutes out of the way. Um, it's just very fun doing that. It's very satisfying uh, just watching the numbers tick up. Uh, you got like a country guy who's your mechanic, and he's like he, he's a he's like an old um, shipbreaker who's like showing you the ropes, uh, and he'll like come over to the intercom and he'll be like, "You got five minutes, Cutter." <laughs> that honestly sounds super interesting. I've not heard of this game before. Yeah, I'd hella suggest it. It's very it's very fun. It's a little graphic intensive, sadly. So there's that. Dang. Um, I, yeah, I can handle that. That's fine. That's fair. Yeah, yeah cause um, you got the new like 3080 shit, right? Yeah, I just got mine today, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I played it on a 970 um, for a while until I got my new graphics card in, um, and it ran it at uh, I think a little, a little under 30 FPS. But the gameplay was interesting enough to um, interesting enough for me to enjoy it. Um, they have like they have a pretty accurate physics system as well. Going too fast, you'll hurt yourself. Mm-hmm. But they have a cool thing where you can. Uh, uh, you control both your hands sort of independently uh, um, sometimes, and so you can reach out and grab things. But you can also use it to slow yourself down if you're going too fast. You'll reach out your arm and sort of like compress themselves like a spring to stop you. It's really cool. Yeah, it's very neat. It sounds it sounds like one of those things where like in real life it probably it would be like a chore and real work, but like in the in the context of like a video game, it sounds like it's pretty dope. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like an occupational hazard, except there's no danger to yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and, and I guess um, I wanted to sh- explain an example of that uh, that I really enjoy is that if you uh, mistakenly unhook all the coolant from the ship first without handling the reactor, because the reactor is still live, um, because that, and the reason why they want you to recycle is because it has that live material in it. Um, but because the reactor is still live, if you accidentally disconnect all the coolant first, or if you turn off the power system that the coolant is attached to, it'll uh, put the reactor into meltdown. You'll shit your pants as you realize you haven't opened up the sh- ship enough to pull out the reactor. And you have just like a live, small warhead essentially in the ship about to go off. Beautiful. Um, wow. Yeah, very fun. Um, that's pretty What's much all I have to say about again? it though. It's called gotcha. Hard Hard Space Shipbreaker. If anyone's hard interested. Hard Space Shipbreaker. Yeah, I'll have to look into that because that honestly sounds yeah. super cool. It's yeah. Right there. Uh, and it's there's still a early access on Steam. It is. Yeah. The biggest thing that they're adding is um, new ships and new, I guess, quote unquote, dangers that can be on the ships and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, currently, the largest things are um, like air pressure issues and uh, um, explosive explosive uh, gas lines or whatnot. Uh, if you and then there's of course a bunch of different other options along uh, uh, excuse me not options uh, what's the word gameplay uh, characteristics that I haven't explained here that are far more in depth than the, than I would like to let on through this podcast. So yeah. Zach, do you want to lead us into your third favorite game this year? Um, I played a lot of games this year, but it was mostly from the backlog. So like actually finding 
um, games that came out this year was kind of difficult to pick for the number three. Mm. So uh, it's a port, so it's kind of cheating, but uh, I'd say probably Persona 4 Gold. Uh, because I recently came to enjoy the Persona series, and I think Golden, like Persona 4, is where it finds its footing on its own. It's a lot different from Shin Megami Tensei at this point. Yeah, I honestly, I forgot um, that that released this year. I remember that was a big deal when they ported a, a Persona game to PC for the first time. Yeah, um, it's very hype, honestly. I've been I've yeah. been wanting to play it after I beat Persona 5. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's I bought it. It's absolutely in my backlog. I'm looking forward to it. Mm. I still haven't bought it yet, but it's it's on. It's it's there eventually. Yeah, because I absolutely adored uh, Persona Five when I played through it, and I, I liked Persona Three, but it's very Persona Three is okay to me, but I, I don't like it as much yeah. as the other entries in this. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, yeah but you can't my, you can't uh, can't pull the candle to shooting yourself to summon your persona. <laughs> I, I think I, the, I don't I think, know. I think the masks in Persona Five might be my favorite, honestly. Th- they're fair. pretty edgy Things too. Like yeah, um, yeah. A, a lot of the charm that I loved about Persona Three was just how old and janky it was. Like everything uh, that makes well, it like a terrible game that is aged poorly, I just found like funny. Uh, Persona Four carries a lot of that over because they're running on the same engine. But Persona mm-hmm. Four also adds in a lot of gameplay elements that. I would say their series mainstays, but we've only had one game past this. One game afterwards. Uh, so. But it like adds in completed social links, pretty much. That was like sort of implemented in three. Mm. Um, it really refines a lot of the features. The characters are some of the best in the series. Probably the best cast there is. Yeah. Great villain. I won't get into that because of spoilers for people yeah. that don't know. Yeah. Um, one of the best villains in the series. It's just all around a good time. I do have one question, actually. Um, yeah. So, uh, I have been, I've been, I have an interest in Persona. Obviously, I was playing Persona Three. The um, what's the what's the like Nether Realm in Persona called? I guess it's called Tartarus. Tartarus yeah. happens during the dark hour. I see. Um, there's always like that main sort of like area. I guess in Persona Five, it was called um, palaces the metaverse. and whatnot. Yeah, yeah the, the metaverse, metaverse with palaces and stuff. Um, what what is that in uh, Persona 4? Out of curiosity, in Persona 4, it's really cool actually. Um, when you start the game off, there's this rumor going around uh, called the Midnight Channel, and at 12 a.m. on a very rainy night, you turn on your TV and it'll display the Midnight Channel, which will be like some sort of eerie image of a person or something similar. Mm. And uh, you're messing around at like a store, like a department store, which is a very important location in the game because that's just where the game hangs out. It's like a headquarters, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. That does that does sound uh, like a good enough plot hook for me to get interested in gold. Yeah, I, I, I think Tartarus is a little too abstract for me to be to be interested in completely. But uh, I I feel like I know so little about like Persona Four and the Midnight Channel and how. Its story works that I'm really interested to, to start it and give it a shot, especially because I feel like I know the least about the cast of Persona 4. That's a that's um, another thing I was going to get. Into, yeah, they seem really interesting. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but what I was saying a second ago, I'm sorry. Um. Uh. In that department store, the way they enter the other world is they accidentally end up going through the TV. So that's, nice. they just go through a flat screen TV and they end up in an alternate reality of their town, basically, <laughs> that they live in. So you just like, that's, that's really how cool. they go in. Instead of using an app or like waiting until a certain time, they just walk in the TV at the department store. It's like a modern version cool. of uh, um, The Witches of Narnia or whatever it is. I, I was thinking of the, the Willy Wonka like thing where you grab the chocolate bar out of the TV and it's oh, yeah. real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, the cast in this game actually really shines more than... Like, this is my second favorite entry in this Persona series, with 5 being my favorite. Um, but this this game definitely has my favorite cast out of all of them, because instead of fighting, like... In Persona 5, you fight the bad guys' shadows as, like, bosses. Like, people that you're trying to change their heart because they're criminals. In this game, the shadows, the shadow bosses are actually your friends, and it's the part of themselves that they don't want to face. So, it's the thing about themselves that they're most embarrassed for. So, once you defeat their shadows, and then they 
get their persona from their shadows being defeated. Uh, you feel like you really know these characters better, which uh, helps, which really helps you, like, I would say get in the world of the game. Huh. That's something. Yeah, it, that it is seems, something fantastic, yeah. Yeah, it sounds kind of like the opposite of, essentially, as you mentioned, the. it sounds like the opposite of the Persona 5 Shadows. A, a yeah. lot more positive, the idea that you're like, you have to accept this part of yourself rather than... Yeah, Persona instead 5, of, yeah that's also how stuff. they get their Personas, too. Once their Shadows defeated, they get their Arcana. Hmm. It's really interesting. Uh, and it lets you like see the character at their worst and their best, too, so... It just hmm. helps with dynamics and things like that. Yeah, because I, I remember I love Persona Five, but sometimes it would take a bit for characters, especially in their their like quote unquote their their palace, mm -hmm. um, to like get for their characters to get going because the main antagonist is like just kind of tangentially related to them most of the time. <laughs> Um, uh, and m yeah, most of the characters stuff is out, outside, but yeah, I think it's cool that like most of your stuff is. And the character development there, like, as you're moving along, is with the main cast. Yeah. And the whole time you're solving a mystery that is legitimately interesting to solve, especially in Golden, because it does a little bit better to cover it up. Ooh, um, okay. Basically, there's serial murders going on in this very small town that you live in. And the next victim will always show up on the Midnight Channel, so you have to go in to save them every time. Ooh, uh, before they're murdered. That sounds super cool, actually. Oh, I yeah. yeah I, I I don't know how much more you want to share about the story, but I think I'm. Oh I'm no, I'm sharing like it. very beginning level stuff too. Okay. Yeah, it gets really? super interesting. Yeah. Have I you have you beaten I... the game yet, out of curiosity? Um, not quite, but I do know what happens because I played it with a friend. I like, see. Kind of right. kind of like backseat right. gaming in a way, but it's a lot of text based stuff. So, yeah. you know, it's I, I kind of got the experience because. I was helping him fight bosses and stuff. Yeah, I was just curious how, about how long um, the game usually needs to take to beat. Oh, oh, it's, like... it's it's a lot shorter than Persona 5 if you've beaten that. Oh, okay. Um, th that's good God. news for me, <laughs> Thank actually. God. Yeah, that, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> you can... Yeah. My friend beat Persona 5 Royal, like, the full game in, like, 90-something hours. And this yeah. Game is, this game, if you're really fast and good at Persona games, you could probably beat it, like, 60-something, maybe. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. Sounds a lot more palatable. Yeah. I, I want to get into the Persona series. Uh, I'd, just... I'd say four or five are your best entry points. Yeah, yeah probably. Those yeah, I, it definitely like. four because uh, I'm... No PlayStation? No, no PlayStation. Uh, yeah, without a PlayStation, yeah, definitely go with four. Mm. I mean, I could buy the PlayStation 3 version, but I mean, I feel like I Ugh. could just wait and get nah, Royal. Don't, don't, yeah, wait for Royal because I'll get... I'll get into Royal later because that is another game of the year for me. Even though it's gotcha, it I, I figured that was year. probably. Uh, uh, it came out this year in the states. I'm pretty. Well, sure, yeah, it right? came out this year in the states, but like in Japan, it came out. Yeah, last that year. that counts. Mm. Those fuckers aren't real. Um, <laughs> if you want, we could wait till you, we talk about Royal. But what do you think of uh, Strikers? Oh, Strikers. Um, I haven't played it because uh, it's. Oh Japan yeah, only still. Yeah. No, no, yeah. From yeah, the, I completely from the forgot demo, about that. It's yeah. super fun. Like it is another Muso game, like Age of Calamity, that is really interesting, and it it does a good job of taking stuff from uh, Persona. Like you can mm -hmm. summon your Persona like just during combos, and it'll it'll like sort of freeze everything. You aim where you want to attack, and then you can still do weaknesses. Uh, and you can get one more like that. Yeah, and then follow up. Yeah, I I completely forgot that Strikers was coming out next year. I'm really excited for that one as well. That with with that mentioned, by the way, I may perhaps we should move on to the next game. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Preston's <laughs> number two. Uh, before we do that, I did want to go through a list because we kind of got into some stuff earlier. Um, what what was your favorite game you played this year? Like that didn't come out in 2020. Like it, maybe something old you picked up or um, something just from last year on sale. If you want to start us off, that I've been recently playing Jet Set Radio a lot, which is pretty fun. But I think, um, might be the original Fallout. Really? Uh, yeah, that's I, fair. I've got I got really far in that game. I haven't quite beat it, but I'm on what's pretty much the final area of the game. I just need to go. I know where the main bad guy is. I just need to go get him. Yeah. Uh, so it's been really fun, actually. Uh, it plays like 
more akin to Dungeons and Dragons, where like I moving takes action points, which is mm -hmm. way different from your regular Fallout game. Uh, but once you get used to it, it's super fun to play. Um, there have been some encounters I've had that have been crazy. Like there's this one time where there's this part where you go to a cave with a death claw in it, and it's the first encounter I had with a death claw. And it was super difficult. I ended up having to go get a companion for the first time in this run. And mm. then, like, immediately doing Psycho and then going in there and taking on this Death Claw. And it took, and it still took a while, but I came on, like, I came out on top and it was a really good feeling. The game yeah. has so much freedom with how you can approach every situation. Yeah, I heard good things about the, like the original Fallout I, games. I've, I downloaded it. I tried to start it, but it, it was just a little too difficult, I think, for me to get into, just because the like the system hasn't aged super well. But I mean, I felt that that same way about Knights of the Old Republic. I, it was just like so old feeling that I couldn't get into it. But when I went back and like really tried to delve into how it worked, I started really enjoying it. So I think Fallout might be Fallout, a Fallout game I need to give a second chance. I tried playing yeah. it like I think a year or two ago, and I got a certain point into it, and I gave up because I didn't have enough caps. Uh, but I I've been like persevering through this run. Once you get past the time limit that is initially on the game, uh, that's when it really opens up. Uh, everything's really interesting. Don't be afraid to use guides for it either because they mm. do not tell you a thing. <laughs> there's a feature yeah, there's a feature in this game where like every NPC that's like pretty important has a feature where you can like hit a button and ask them a question where you type something in and you ask them that like about that thing you type. And like most of the time they will like 80% of the time they will say they haven't heard of it and it's the most annoying feature I think ever implemented in a game it feels so useless but actually once you actually find your way around and start to figure out what's going on it's super fun to try to sneak around because that's what i've been doing i don't have a very strong character so i have to avoid combat as much as possible so i just have a really good sneak stat and i just go around and i just kill for stuff and that's how I've buffed myself up to the point where I am. I've got power armor and everything. Nice. 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 Yeah, I, it's yeah. super fun. Yeah, I own, like, the original few, like, one and two. I want to play them. It's just, like, I feel like there's, like, a weird barri barrier of entry where it's, like, oh, okay, sure. yeah. Oh, yeah. the barrier of entry is huge, especially yeah, with the first game. I, would, I haven't there. tried out the second game, but I'm pretty sure it's a little easier because there's no time limit, like, bearing mm -hmm. over you in the first one. Mm -hmm. But, like, the first one can be super cryptic. I got stuck at the beginning because your first task is find a water chip. And yeah. the way you do that, they give you the location of a vault that might have a water chip, and that's it. You get there, and then there's a big hole, like an elevator shaft that doesn't work, and the game tells you you need rope. And you immediately have no idea where to get rope, and yeah. that's like the first conundrum. Yeah. yeah, I feel like, and it's not just like the new Fallout games, but like I feel like that's all the thing with like a lot of the n newer games is that it's like, hey, now I need rope, oh, here's just like... A location on the map where's a rope. I was like, I kind of like the whole thing where it's like, hey, it's not holding your hand. You, you this item. Think of like where it could be. Yeah, and... I like, I like that. But at the same time, when you're scrambling around because there's a time limit and you're oh, no, asking, no, no, you're definitely. asking the NPC where rope is, and they say they've never heard of that. Mm -hmm. I get kind of annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> rope? What is this rope you speak of? Yeah, I haven't. I, I had to look up a guide for some parts, but it's okay to do that for this game. Because the, the map is really big, actually. I never... The way the map works is it's like this big, this huge area. And when once you leave a location, uh, it just shows like you as a little dot walking through the desert. And multiple days pass whenever you try to get somewhere. But that that's my uh, game that I played this year that I that didn't come out. Mm -hmm. Dope. I Pretty certainly good. did not expect to to hear about Fallout, but I, I was kind of curious yeah. who would have like the the oldest game that they enjoyed. Um, 
If, if you guys don't mind, I'll, I'll take a stab at it next. Yeah, yeah go ahead. So this one was a little tough for me because I wasn't sure whether or not I should pick between Monster Hunter World um, or Valkyria Chronicles. Uh, but I ended up going with Valkyria Chronicles just because I kind of stopped playing Monster Hunter World this year. Uh, whereas Valkyria Chronicles is something I, I started and finished and really enjoyed. Um, I kind of picked it up like over, I think it was a fall break or something. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, it's a essentially a, a strategy game. Um, it's it's kind of like your your Fire Emblem or your XCOM, but rather than just positioning your units and then like attacking like in Fire Emblem, uh, anytime you select a unit with one of your command points, uh, you essentially are kind of in a more like actiony uh, part of the game uh, where you have like a limited amount of uh, like movement, and so you can you want to get yourself in a position. Uh, and you've got an action so you can like shoot or like throw grenades or heal up. Uh, so it felt a lot more interesting as a strategy game because of that extra dimension to me. Um, like with Fire Emblem, you run up and you attack Ghiradelf or whoever the fuck the evil wizard is for that game. And you see like, ah, he'll do 44 damage to me. I'm just going to cancel and move backwards. Uh, but like, even if you like have a plan, um, people could be hiding like on your map in Valkyria Chronicles uh, or they could just uh, shoot at you like while you approach and it, a lot of your like plans get tested and often destroyed <laughs> or broken like while you're moving around trying to accomplish something and you have to adapt really quickly on the fly mm -hmm. it just had like a really interesting like strategy element to it that I don't think I've experienced in another sort of uh, game like that but I, I finished it this year and I really enjoyed it. I ended up playing it on uh, the Nintendo Switch because they ported it. Uh, but unfortunately, the rest of them are like not available anywhere but like the PS Portable or something. Sure. Yeah, I've been. Um, I'm actually in the middle of that game right now. Uh, I've always had an interest in it, and uh, when uh, Wizard started playing it, I picked it up. For, I think maybe about a week ago, and about mm. a third of the way through it now, I think. Um, I do agree. One, one thing I wanted to point out, uh, it's a fantastic game. Very fun. Um, great character development. It's weird. Um, there's, they have certain main characters that are part of your squad, um, but some of the squad characters, every squad character has their own sort of unique personality, but uh, sort of unlike Fire Emblem, they never go into it that deeply. But uh, nonetheless, you still build an emotional connection to them because any lethal encounter with those characters means that you lose them. So. Um, I think that's very interesting. Uh, I will say as one complaint though, there there are great moments where they'll have enemies hiding behind corners that really like mess you up. Uh, but I have died, one, I've lost missions one too many times with them immediately recruiting a Lancer and uh, blowing up the main tank and the, getting a game over. Uh, because it hit, yeah. it hit its reactor in the behind. <laughs> yeah, every, every tank essentially is like obviously this this huge like armored machine, but there's a radiator on the back that you, if you're able to shoot with an explosive, it pretty much just crits you, uh, which is great when you're trying to like outflank an enemy tank and take it out from behind with, the, with your Lancer, but they can also do it to you just as easily. Mm -hmm. And I, there have mm -hmm. been several missions where I've started it and been like, okay, I'm in a good position, and a Lancer will just pop out from a corner and just say, uh, <laughs> couldn't even survive turn one. What yeah, a fucking try, joke. And take me out. Turn, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's definitely very enjoyable with a great story, um, but don't go into a mission expecting to beat it first try um, anytime, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, th there were definitely a lot of moments where I essentially had to do like a test run and just sprint in with scouts and figure out, okay, this is where everyone's located. Now I can beat this correctly. But there were a couple moments um, when the game like works and everything clicks together, it clicks really well. There was one moment where I essentially stayed on the pause screen for a bit and just plotted out like essentially a plan of attack and i was like i bet that this thing will be here i'm betting on them backing this up with a tank i'm gonna move these people here so the moment this tank appears i can shoot it in like one turn and like coming over the plan and changing it on the fly and like applying it and just like crushing an objective and like getting an a rank or something feels so good it makes me feel like a tactical fucking genius. And then the next four missions, I lose like every turn constantly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I have not played this game, but uh, it may be something of interest to me. I'm not a big fan of like the... Um, 
I don't know what I'm saying. Like kind of like, kinda like, like strategy the strategy games. Yeah, the whole strategy ish thing. I played a few of them. They're not. I don't mind them. It's just. It does feel like you have to just kind of like replay them a bunch of times before you actually understand what's going on. Mm. That's fair. I mean, the game itself is very intuitive. It's just every. Um, I mean, it's not even that complex. Uh, every character. Um, essentially, I mean, a tank blows up a tank. Guys with rocket launchers blow up, blow up, uh, um, blow up tanks as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, no, no, and it makes sense. It, yeah. There's like this hierarchy of like units can affect different units differently, mm -hmm. but yeah. Mm -hmm. But what I mean to say is that it's not it's not that complex either. Like the weird sort of like axe, um, rock, paper, scissors system of Fire Emblem. Um, it's all stuff that's like immediately immediately obvious, you know. Mm -hmm. gotcha. it, it, um, the game is sort of a um, like an alternate history World War II with an anime spin put on it. What, um, is, what isn't an anime spin on it though? All right, it, it is. Go. It is. I will say, I, I I don't know if it's super problematic or not. I don't think it is. But it was really weird to see all this like anime bullshit, like mechs and like magic <laughs> combined with like actual like genocide and like racism towards like a group there's of people. There is a legitimate mission where you have to free like um these oppressed race of individuals from a concentration camp yeah and, and like and not, not all of them survive they, they call it a concentration camp yeah it's wow. it's it, yeah the, it does not like really pull any punches there it's 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 very weird but there are also some issues with it that i, I can't get into because of spoilers but that's gotcha. yeah, it's it's <laughs> it, it's just weird seeing like actual world war ii genocide like alongside like magic lances and shit it's, it's very strange but it, it's unlike any game i've ever played like its setting is really interesting to me so you, you finished the game right yeah i've beaten it okay well maybe we'll see a review in the future there you go. yeah i i honestly have been just considering it <coughs> uh, do you want to go next nice man dan uh i'd very much like to go next i think um the, the game that I played most recently that came out not this year, but I think it's a nice little cathartic game as well, is a game called The Long Dark. Uh, I try to make it my mission to play it every winter. It's a winter, it's a winter-esque game, I suppose. The plot of the game is that uh, um, the you're in, you're, in, you're in Canada, and uh, for some reason you sort of like straight off of whatever travel plans you're having. I think the original plot was that you were, uh, survived a plane crash. Um, but there's been this geothermal event that's caused the world to almost freeze over entirely. Uh, and they do have a huge story that's episodic out now, but I never, I haven't really had an interest in that. I've always played the uh, survival mode. The survival mode is where I really get into it because uh, there's an immense focus on, while well, normal survival games have like drinking food and water is sort of like a, uh, you know, a side objective. Like in the forest, the, the main objective isn't hunting animals. I mean, like birds will land right in front of you and you can just slap them down and get food. But in the long dark, pretty much every time you like do something to just fill up that meter is like a goal and an immense reward. Um, it, for, uh, for an example, uh, you can find a lot of like snack items left out in the world from just like abandoned buildings and stuff like that. Uh, but there's not much benefit out of it. Um, like with canned foods, you get uh, empty cans, which you can use to melt snow and boil water and uh, consume other liquid, I guess, remedies of some sort. Uh, they have like herbal tea and coffee that you can find in the world as well. But killing killing an animal, for example, um, not only nets you food, but it nets you its um, guts, which can be used to make bows and uh, other survival materials as well. Um, but I guess the main appeal of it is you're sort of exploring this derelict world the whole time. There's like a bunch of areas of interest. You go through like a dam at one point if you'd like to. Um, and among that, the game's entirely open world, I should mention. It's not linear in any case. Um, That's cool. Yeah, it's very, it's very nice. Uh, beyond food and water, you have to manage uh, your own body temperature. Uh, which includes like layering clothes correctly, not just putting them on. Uh, as well as ensuring what you're wearing isn't too constricting so that we're able to run. Because there's wildlife in this game as well. Uh, wolves, bears, and whatnot that can uh, go after you. They do make a mention that uh, you shouldn't treat the game like reality. Wolves don't normally attack people. Uh, which really puts a good warning sign on this game on how terif fucking terrifying wolves are. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, they'll like stalk you down for for long distances. They can see you from a far way away. You'll hear them howl, and you have to do like the the fucking uh, uh, okay girl from like Jurassic World as you're like slowly backing up in, in desperate search for shelter behind you as the wolf's chasing you down. It's very it's very nice. Um, it's a very, it's a very uh, homey game. It's one that I like playing uh, in the winter, where I'm cuddled up in a blanket and stuff, imagining I'm this survivor trying to move throughout the world, and ensuring it doesn't freeze his fingers off and whatnot. And those meters dropping down to zero don't immediately kill you either. So like, you'll drop down to like freezing temperatures, but you'll be at risk of hypothermia. So you might get knocked out at some point or something like that. And a bad scuffle with a wolf that knocks you out doesn't kill you because. Sometimes they sort of just ravage you and beat the shit out of you, and then they'll leave you alone because they're scared of you or something like that. <laughs> so you'll be left battered and bruised from a wolf accident, but the wolf might still be around, so you're like injured in all these ways and you're trying to sneak around and get away from it. It's very involved. Um, mm. It makes you constantly worried about what's going to happen next because food, you can only carry a limited amount of food, and you're always looking for more to eat. You're always looking for more ways to get water or um, as another resource, burnable materials so you're able to keep warm all the time. It's very interesting. I'd heavily suggest anyone to play it. Yeah, um, I, I've seen my brother play it quite a bit. I'm pretty sure it's, it's in my library. It seems pretty interesting. I, I think, based on the way that you described it, it seems interesting to me. I've been kind of thinking about it. Like, something like Don't Starve, or I guess, like, Minecraft to an extent. Um, mm -hmm. Getting food and, like, surviving and, like, managing temperature is kind of more like a checklist chore thing to do in those games. A lot of times you're building towards some other like main goal like with don't starve like obviously you, you've got to like set up stuff to get food but a lot of times you can start kind of automating things and it's about like building more technology and stuff like that but it seems like the long dark is kind of a lot more about like there's more emphasis on survival like the things that you need to do to survive are kind of more difficult mm. um and i think that the main idea it seems like to me as an outsider at least is just kind of surviving as long as you can and taking that time to explore this this huge world uh, which i think yeah. is really interesting mm. the, and in fact the way mechanics work um encourage the exploration even further because you might come find like a nice town that's very nice to settle into and just wait around and explore around and uh just i guess yeah look at the world i suppose um for a while but as you're going through houses those houses are going to run out of resources eventually and the game um, really puts forth the effort of forcing you to move on and look for more uh, like resources for food or water or um, like I said before better clothing your clothing gets damaged throughout the game as well so you need to look for more clothing materials that you can rip apart and uh, uh, sew onto your own clothes so that we can fix them up so I, I haven't I haven't played the game I've heard of it so is the game is the like world static or is it like a does the world change when you make a new game no, the world's static, um, and I think okay. it's designed that way um, to express the episodic main story, but there's still um, uh, room there to sort of like interpret what happened to the world. One, one thing I find very interesting is occasionally there's a random event called the um, Aurora, which is the Aurora Borealis shows up. I don't, I don't know um, uh, the physics behind it in real life, uh, but the story goes is that uh, it, it sets off electromagnetic waves in such a way to it returns some power to uh, uh, computers or whatnot, or just street lights and stuff, which are fucking terrifying in the middle of the night when street lights start flashing and scaring the shit out of you. Um, Interesting. But, but as a result, there are some computers that are on and they have the standard lore fanfare and readable mm. text. So oh, that's that, so cool. Mm. Yeah, that's really neat, actually. Yeah, it's very nice. Um, from what I've um, been able to play from it, the most recent thing I remember, I don't know if it's in that in depth, though, to be fair. Uh, the most recent thing that I read was something along the lines of, it'd be really nice to take my uh, kid out to play soccer today. I uh, can't wait to do that. Um, and of course, you assume the character didn't come back to, to finish that diary entry um, due, to the, due to the events of the world. Due to the but fact the world that they just had so much fun playing soccer. Right. Well, and, and beyond that, the world isn't actually um, devoid of people. There are no living people, sadly, but you do find like the frozen corpses of other survivors that have attempted to get through there. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe the story does involve um, other characters. I think one of the episodes involves you um, in the, the plane crash, I suppose, or some other incident, but you're taking care of some sickly other survivor. So you have to deal with um, some other guy's warmth or whatever, mm -hmm. I, I would assume, along the way.
But yeah, um, I, that's my that's my two cents on it. It's a fairly simplistic game. Um, it's not like I don't know Oscar worthy, but it's definitely like a game that's worth spending yeah. time with just to see what I, it's like. I think just Enjoying. anything right now, especially that can achieve that kind of like coziness, I, I suppose of like the of like the survival mm. genres is really nice. I I love getting into that shit um i haven't played it myself but i it's been a while since i've played a survival game like that so i, I might have to try to try it and get into it surely yeah it's definitely very rewarding to especially after all the stress because you're you're constantly getting colder to find a building and sit down and you're like time to make myself a fire mm-hmm. or whatever and like cook up some cook up some food and boil some water to, to like build up yourself for the next uh, for the next travel no, definitely. I have like a sweet spot for survival games, which is weird because I, I usually hate like doing micromanaging things. Like I hate, I, I mean I don't hate them, but I, I suck at like micromanaging like in games things like that. Yeah. But, like, but I I enjoy like when hun- there's a hunger mechanic or like a food mechanic or something stupid. Like the survival aspect's fun to me for some reason. Yeah. Mm. So, Rhino, what's your your favorite game you played this year that didn't come out in 2020? Well, uh, I really enjoyed the, the playing Terraria again uh, when Journey's End, the Journey's End update came out. That, that was super fun to start again. With oh, another yeah, Terraria man. Save. I forgot that Journey's End came out this year. This year yeah. has felt so long. <laughs> yeah, starting again with another save from the beginning was super fun. Mm-hmm. I just, I know we, it's been like years since we played together, and I know we tried getting more people together with it, and I think the beginning stages it worked, but I think later on we had some people fall out. But it was cool to see like the new bosses, all the oh, new yeah. items. Like, the first life was super fun, but hard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What Part of play? Discord completely messes her up though. <laughs> what did we did we play on normal or did we do expert? We did an expert. Well, uh, yeah, we we did expert. I haven't even tried okay. master. We should try master mode sometime. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, want to do master mode. Or maybe it's, even a journey it's mode. Hard. Well, that'd be interesting. Mm. The journey mode's kind of cool because it's like all a the item. yeah. Journey mode's cool because it's kind of like a a creative mode ish in a sense, but it still requires you to do exploration because it yeah, requires it's, yeah, it's the terraria style of creative mode because they would never give something to you for free in that game mm. i think it's cool because I, I messed with the the journey mode a little bit where it's basically you have to collect a certain amount of items of a specific item before you can just make an yeah. unlimited amount of them and you can't use it to cheat for your other characters too because they can only play on journey mode world journey all regular awesome. characters can't go there mm. which is cool yeah yeah it's just another cool way to play that game especially because one, one of my favorite things is i love just collecting all the shit in terraria and there's so much stuff yeah that, there's just so many ways to enjoy that game like the amount of furniture and materials like it's such it's so crazy for like a game if you just like want to build but at the same time it has such an in-depth and like fun combat system with enemies and bosses like Usually I just build shitty wooden huts and I just try to kill things. But I remember mm-hmm. playing several times and building some like huge structures and there's a the, all the like we had a castle in the one. Yeah, that yeah. nice castle. There's all the um like wiring mechanics and a shit ton of mechanisms you can make. There's like the alchemy system. There's a system. lot of stuff to it's, do. It's it's always been like a super cool game, and they have only made it better as the years have continued. There's golf now. There's fishing. <laughs> like golf is such a funny addition. <laughs> there's so much cool shit to do. Like I, I, Terraria is one of those games that I, I don't think I will ever stop enjoying. Every time I play it, I feel like I, I try something new or learn something different. Um, and that, that's the thing that's so fun to me about it is like even between like trying to prep and like master these like enemies and fight the wall of flesh like you can just sit down and like dick around and fish with your friends or play around of golf or turn exactly. on bbb and kill each other it's it's just so cool 
there's just so much content in that game um and even though it's it's over now there's so much shit to enjoy and i cannot wait to see what they do next uh, i actually heard a rumor uh, i haven't looked into it but i heard that they might be coming back again i'm not sure that's what i heard i'm not exactly sure yeah, so someone, like else, some... someone else has mm. heard that okay yeah, Terraria I, I, might not be done yet. That would be super interesting. I, I honestly, if they just kept working on it, it would it's not bother me remotely. Game. I um, think what they're mainly working on might be more mod support and stuff. That's fair. I haven't I think, even dived into the I think, they're, I think the they're trying their best to actually, instead of making more content updates, uh, they're going to move on to other projects, I'm assuming. Uh, I think what their main focus will be will be to have the player base have the best possible way to make content for the game, and they're leaving it in the player's hands. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, like some sort of work, workshop on. system I think would be the perfect way to... Yeah, I think they're actually the integrating Steam Workshop mm -hmm. for mods. Yeah, I it's, think, I it's think such a fantastic sandbox experience. It's just, there's so much shit to enjoy. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why I, it's one of my favorite games and the reason, uh, my favorite yeah, game of the year. Yeah, it's definitely one of my favorite games I've ever played. I just, it, it's just nostalgic for me because I remember playing, it was like one of the first games I bought on Steam. I think it was the first game I bought on Steam, actually. I, I, I think, think that I, may have been the case for me, too. I think I got it just to play that game. Yeah. I remember I joined you guys and it was... It's been a while. I don't think it was middle. I think it was early high school when we like all started. Kind we all of. started playing Terraria together. Yeah. Yeah, and then I just, it's just been nostalgia. I mean, or we're, we're all out of high school now, mm. and it, it, it's just like the games. They they it's I don't know. It's they say the ter the game's over, but. Well, yeah, there's just so much stuff that, like... There's so much... We haven't do done that. everything in Terraria. Yeah, I, absolutely everything. not, we haven't. Like, like, we could easily start up another world, like, mm. right after this podcast is finished <laughs> up, and we, yeah. would still, we would still be able to find new stuff to exactly. do. Exactly. Especially exactly. with all the Master Mode stuff. I mean, like, that's the thing that interests me so much, is even after you've beaten it, even if you can beat it on Master Mode, like, the skill ceiling, it feels like it's so high... Yeah. Like, trying to beat it with, like, worse shit, or trying to beat it faster. I mean, there's just so much room for, like, creativity and how you want to tackle everything. And there's, like, no right or wrong answer. Yeah, either. I've, I have, like, 541 hours. I think it's the game I've put oh, the yeah. most I have, time into. I have a ton of hours. I think it might be over 700. Or, yeah, yeah no, like, it's, it's over that. I've played this game since I was in middle school. It's unlike it's like my fantastic. bad laptop, but it's a pixelated game. So it could <laughs> yeah, run. yeah. So it could it could run. So it was like the only thing I played like yeah. this in Minecraft. In I remember playing on it laptop. on my shitty ta like Android tablet that could barely run it, and like the game yeah. was so janky right. on mobile. Oh man. Yeah, I think I really liked about Terraria is that the character files actually save all your data. That, so it's not that is a feature I love. Compared mm, to the Minecraft like, world, and yeah, character being synced yeah. up, I yeah. love having a character and being able to go to different worlds with yeah. that character. That Th there's so a cool. really interesting emphasis on that. Like with Minecraft, you always play as the same like random ass dude. You're Steve or uh, Peter Griffin or whoever the fuck your skin is, uh, and like it, the world is the real character, quote unquote, like the thing that you're building. But like you're making like a loadout and accessories and like costumes and stuff for this character that can go between different worlds it's really cool that you can build both the world and a, a, like a character at the same yeah. time i I, yeah. I love that feature so much it That's really seems yeah Terraria definitely seems to be like a game i couldn't imagine it in a situation where it wasn't focused on the character especially with mm -hmm. you like level up health and stuff and there's things like vanity slots and everything like that Everything yeah. you upgrade about the... Like, in Minecraft, everything you do in the world is upgrading the world in some way. Even in modded Minecraft, like, things mm -hmm. like Agrarian Skies, you're not making your character better, you're making your island better, or yeah. making your plot of land better. But in Terraria, mm -hmm. the focus is always on improving your character in some way, whether it be Yeah, because you're always trying any... to get, like, the new weapon. Yeah. And it or... all culminates in that, like... Still, 
still pretty hard to me final boss with the moon lord mm. like you can cheat you can definitely cheat that boss but i think like it can kill you just hard enough for it to be entertaining yeah I also i just think terraria has a bunch of replayability i mean obviously yeah. minecraft is just an infinite sandbox of doing whatever but like terraria is kind of that same boat you could always refight the bosses you could always create a new world. You can just drag and drop your same character across hundreds of different worlds and play with friends. It's it's just it's just a fun experience. Mm. It's like right. uh, it's like local multiplayer RuneScape, brother. Oh my god! <laughs> I would not compare it to RuneScape at You're all. Right. Damn it! That that remind that reminds me of the game I of the year. A of, I wasted a lot of life playing RuneScape uh, this year, and quite year. honestly, if Long Dark weren't so sentimental at the moment, I would have definitely said that that was the that was the game that I enjoyed most. I, this I don't year. blame yeah. you. I pl I started playing RuneScape a bunch like last year, and then uh, I think I kind of dragged everyone down that rabbit hole with me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, get me. I, I literally picked it up purely because my computing, my ethics and computing class was so fucking boring and I had nothing else to do. So I just downloaded RuneScape for the first time and played yeah. it on my shitty, like tiny little phone. And I was like, this is so much more interesting than whatever we're talking about. <laughs> right. Man, that... I don't know how you guys do that. To me, that <laughs> I is don't like know how the, either. That is the most nothing game ever Dude, released to it me. It is like, by definition, soul food the video game. I don't yeah, understand what it, you're talking it's, about. It, it definitely so, is. I saw some like some people talking about it, uh, and I think they summed it up really well. And it was just like, RuneScape is essentially just like, go on the wiki, find something, and being like, oh, in 2100 hours, I can just do this shit. And that'll make this activity 50% faster? Yo, mm -hmm. let's go. That's dope as hell. It's <laughs> just mean, like, uh, it's just throwing time that. away in like <laughs> the most... I did a quest, I did a quest with them where we were in like, I think it was like a haunted house or something. Hell um, yeah, brother, yeah. Preston was just like walking through the house and I was following him and nothing happened. Not a yeah. single thing happened the whole time. There's chairs that fall around in that building, man. I, I don't love, understand I what you're chairs. talking about. Yeah. If you open the closet, you can fight a zombie. I, w I was go. about to say, like, I did not expect of all the games up for us to talk about that we would remotely mention an old school RuneScape. But that it's, game, that game, that, I, I'm not playing it right now, and I probably will not touch it for a very long time. But that game's kind of cool. <laughs> Cool. Okay. And, so and it's free. Yeah. If if it's 2020, it's been a shitty year. If you just want to throw time away and you have way too much free time, old school RuneScape still kicks ass. That's <laughs> very fantastic. It's a great game. Even if free to play is entertaining enough to enjoy without that. And also, I don't know when this podcast is getting thrown up, but everyone fucking Trailblazer is still a thing in old school RuneScape. If you guys aren't, if you guys don't know, Trailblazer is um, this limited time league. Uh, that RuneScape's throwing up. Uh, to all, all members, you don't have to pay anything other than the $11. Uh, I think it's a, I don't know if it's a week or a month. Um, probably a month. It's, um, a yeah. dollars a week? What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm free to play. But I did, I did, uh, invest a little bit to play, um, uh, to play the league, and the league's fantastic. I think the league would be a great point to, to jump into the game if you guys wanted to try that out. It'll be going in thing until like halfway through January. So gotcha. just that. Cool. That's cool. Yeah, I, okay. I, I think yeah. I think Shadow that's everybody's. Yeah, oh, yeah. Shadow 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 as well. That series will always be better than The Office. <laughs> <laughs> I can back uh, that, brother. Yeah, office is too cringe <laughs> to, to make me enjoy it. Alright, uh, do we want to move on quickly through through our, our second favorite games? Well, yeah. I can I can do mine really quickly. Yeah, actually. let's just go through yours. Um, one, Zach. Yeah, super quickly. Uh, we already talked about this game, but it is my second favorite game that came out this year. Uh, Age of Calamity, really good. But we already talked about that pretty in depth earlier yeah. about the combat, the story, everything like that. So can't mm -hmm. waste too much time. On it. I, I am curious though. Uh, who I know you haven't unlocked all the characters, but do you have a, like a personal favorite fighter? Right, that's such oh, a yeah. stupid question. Actually, now that yeah. I'm thinking about it, uh, it's absolutely Impa, right? Yeah, it's absolutely Impa and their Bosa. Impa is my favorite though because. Uh, Pulling off the combos to, like, summon a bunch of people at once is super satisfying to do. 
and that For sure. like the amount of extra damage you get from having your clones out is really oh, cool it's, as it's well. Ridiculous. Yeah, it's super fun. She's my favorite character. Mm. Uh, my my favorite character right now is, and I guess this is a, a little bit of spoilers if you haven't played the game, uh, is at some point you unlock Master Koga. Uh, um, yeah, that's not too much of a spoiler. He's like one of those extra characters, yeah, pretty much. I I honestly adore him purely because his like main mechanic is all of his attacks like hurt himself. Like not like he doesn't take health damage from it, but essentially it just like hits him and he gets frustrated. And once you fill up the meter, he'll fall onto the ground and do a complete tantrum, and so you'll essentially be like left like. Um, completely like av available to get hit by stuff but if you use your special uh your unique attack uh before you hit the ground when you have like full like frustration you'll fire this massive fuck off laser that goes through people's <laughs> weak gauges so you can literally just like use like one combo fall to the ground activate the giant laser and then just melt through anyone's like weak point gauge and weak point smash them it's so fun to Beautiful. like just fight against like like, I used him to fight through, like, five Guardians and just weak point smashed all of them. It was fantastic. Yeah. While we're on a high note talking about this character, by the way, I was just doing a little research. Um, I, I remember who Master Koga is now. Mm. Uh, but just searching his name, I did find at least two images that were both inflation porn of him. So oh, fantastic. <laughs> Thank, to... Thanks for popping our bubble. Yeah, I just wanted to bring, oh just wanted to bring the little emotional excitement oh. down to, <laughs> onto a normal level. After why would you do this? To us? <laughs> hey, can you send me those? <laughs> Hell yeah, I'll send both, brother. Fantastic. <laughs> There's one of them. Uh, he's wielding he's wielding a banana very angrily. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's I pretty unfair. Also, this is very low res, admittedly. <laughs> oh, that's how well, I like my. While you're doing more. that, uh, I will go through my. Oh dear God. <laughs> we'll get through my my second favorite. Oh. Um, so, see, I, and, and I, I might be stepping on somebody's toes here, um, and this might come as a shock, but my my second favorite of the game this year was Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Definitive Edition. Definitely stepping on my toes there. Yeah, I knew I knew that was your number one. <laughs> That's my number one, um, to be honest. It, oh, <laughs> if you haven't heard of. Uh, Xenoblade. It's it's a Monolith Soft's action JRPG series. Um, and I didn't play it when it originally came out in the Wii. I was too young and completely unaware. But I kind of picked it up after Shulk was added to Smash on the 3DS. And I absolutely fucking fell entirely in love with it. Um, even though it was on my 3D, my tiny three, new 3DS screen in like downgraded Wii graphics and like my system was struggling to like play play the music I mean I, I just absolutely was captivated by it uh, and so when I saw that they were like re-releasing it I was so excited because uh, I definitely think it, it needed some polishing here and there and, and while it's not like completely perfect and there are some changes that I wish they had made it is absolutely still a fantastic fucking game and if you enjoy JRPGs and have not played it yet, you absolutely owe it to yourself to do that. Wasn't the uh, 3DS version like a new 3DS exclusive? Like, yeah, it was, like, so, which certainly one. didn't help it uh, do well, probably. So I'm hoping it's doing well uh, now. It's it's absolutely fantastic. Mm. It's just got yeah. such a great story, such great characters. Like I, I really love the combat system. It's oh no! Yeah, so I, I put uh, I put Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition as my number one because just uh, you helped me get into the game. Uh, I, I picked up Xenoblade Chronicles two last year because you're just like it's such a good game. Bro. <laughs> I, I fell you in know. love with that game too. Uh, they're they're pretty different. They're they're pretty different, but I mean, yeah, I mean the combat's different. The music is different but both feel fantastic and sound fantastic mm -hmm. uh story wise both of them are fantastic i haven't finished either one of them yet but my plan is to finish uh, the definitive edition return to xenoblade 2 finish that and then come back and do the 
uh, epilogue or whatever the new story is for mm. Definitive Edition. Yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. I completely forgot about Future Connected. Yeah, full. D- I have not played Future Connected yet. I forgot yeah, that I'm, was included. I'm going to do that the very last. Yeah, that's, that's when Schult finally gets a good outfit. <laughs> I'm I listen, man. Those trunks are hot. I don't know. Listen, man. <laughs> to, I to be hate, fair, the, I the, hate <laughs> Xenoblade fashion. What the hell are they wearing? Oh my to god. To be fair, you should, usually you know, they aren't should, wearing anything. Uh, when, when I'm playing through it, I make them all completely uh, nude. Hell yeah, brother. I mean, I like I like to um, think about them as all Star Fox characters without the airplanes, and I give them all the mech pants and just remove their shirts. So they look like <laughs> that so is true. Like, yeah, they just look like they have giant robotic legs in their upper torso. They're just <laughs> sitting on them, walking around. Yeah, I really like in the original. You couldn't change like the di- there was no difference between like your equipment and like what equipment you were wearing in terms of like vanity. So your characters would look like absolute shitheads. They were ugly as fuck. And now you can select any clothes you want. So now everyone's making them look like complete shitheads and ugly as fuck, but on purpose. And it's wonderful. (laughs) Yeah, I I wouldn't want it any other way. I mean, Uh, if I could run around with Shulk shirtless 24-7, why wouldn't I? Of course, every character is also fucking ripped, I I would like to mention. One man's a piece of cake. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know how far you guys have uh, gotten, but in my opinion, Melia is definitely the best girl in Dune yeah. One. Personally, oh I don't really like you know Blade that much. I can I cannot get into it. That's fair. It's That's really fair. Yeah. It, how I see it is that it's more of a <laughs> it's it's a visual novel, not a game. <laughs> even as someone who absolutely adores jrpgs trying to do everything in that game not necessarily 100 percent it but like do everything i can spot has been a little brain numbing uh it definitely has like some of the worst quests i've ever played a lot of them are cool but there's so many and sometimes um, getting the quest you want is so convoluted like i talked to a random ass guy and he was like can you fix my sword for me and i collected shit and he gave me a new art for the monado <laughs> and like i i was so blown away i'm like this like how why did this random ass quest like give me such like an amazing like a new skill to use for like mm-hmm. the god sword and, like everything else gives me just like bugs or like 50 gold pieces and like all this bullshit the quest system is definitely not perfect I feel like that's fairly uh, but, standard JRPG. Yeah, standard. I feel like that's that's true, and they absolutely did not fix it in Xenoblade 2. It, if anything, it's worse. My main thing that I, I can't say really, like, I can't really get into with Xenoblade is it's got, like, people call it, like, a real-time RPG or something like that, but, uh, I just like to call it MMO combat, and it's the same reason that I don't like MMOs. That combat is just really boring to me. Like, mm. Oh, More fair. so than regular turn-based, I think. Yeah, that's, that's fair. And it's sort of like a, oh, I don't know. I think it's a the weird way of thinking about it. It's certainly the similar in the same sort of like auto attack sense, but yeah, um, yeah. I, I think, having, I think I, the I just, auto attack takes a lot out of it for me. That's Even true. though it's such a simple thing, but like it just doesn't seem all that interesting. That's mm-hmm. fair. Yeah, I think, um, and just to, in its defense, I suppose as well. Um, uh, just so any outside view doesn't doesn't mistake it, the auto um, the, the combat is based around um, you automatically attack enemies that you follow around. Uh, but the the focus of combat is not instead of um, yeah you have to use skills attacks, uh, yeah in between auto ability. attacks and stuff like that and you have to time it. Mm-hmm. And they inflict debuffs that your um, fellow partners can also play off of and yeah. combo with as well. It's yeah a, a lot of it's interesting because it feels like a. A relatively large part of combat is the equipment and like setup that you have beforehand because like gyms let you customize your character so much Mm -hmm. um and like creating synergies between characters um but yeah it's a weird combat system because on the surface it really is just selecting things with cooldowns which makes it like look a lot like mmo stuff um but and and if you're fighting just a random ass bunny or a gorilla like sometimes it really is just like okay this move does more damage from the side use this bing boom this combos into that and then use backslash and i'm good but i think where the game really shines is uh there are a lot of instances especially fighting the um 
uh, what are they called? Unique monsters, where they'll have like special attacks or strategies that like are will absolutely wreck your shop unless you are like playing kind of close attention and like aware of how they work. And it's it's kind of more reactionary um, in like some of the bigger fights because it's all about like essentially sometimes if a turn is going to kill you or injure you or like debuff you you'll see a vision of the future so like Mm -hmm. essentially you now know okay i have 10 seconds before this enemy uses this move which kills me uh which in my opinion fixes an an issue that i have with turn-based combat where sometimes you don't know what the fuck's gonna come next Uh, that's the thing that i like about turn-based combat though yeah, and so sometimes you'll just, like, you'll have to use the Monado to, like, shatter this future and change it to something else. Sometimes it will just get shattered by random chance. Sometimes you'll do all this crazy shit and you'll shatter the future, like, a hundred different times. It's it's just super fun, uh, and it, it fixes an issue I have. One of my biggest pet peeves, and I hate to dog on Persona 5, but it, it does this, um, is whenever you're fighting a boss or a strong enemy and, like, you get the text message that just says so-and-so is readying a strong attack i wonder what you should do and like you just have to guard for a turn and move Uh, on and like the fact that they just like announce it beforehand because if it just came out of nowhere it would suck and it wouldn't be fair but with with xenoblade you know what's coming at you that i can get into Mm. um while we're still talking about combat stuff um i don't I'll get this out of the way because this podcast will probably... uh, I don't know how many of these we're going to do. But, like, this will be the first people hear from me. So I'm just going to get out of the way that I don't normally like turn-based RPGs. But I have a soft spot for SMT and Persona. Uh, SMT being Shin Megami Tensei. Tensei. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Shin Megami Tensei and Persona. So... I like how in those games, it's more focused on, like, strange strategies. Like, the way you fight bosses in these kind of games have some sort of flow, because the weakness system is pretty intuitive. But also, what I wanted to bring up is the when they're readying a strong attack, the thing that you don't- they let you know that a strong attack is coming, but they don't tell you when exactly. Because sometimes they'll do it right after they are, like, on the next turn after they start charging. Or it'll take one or two turns. Mm, And that's the thing I like, actually. Because instead of, like, it being a thing about fairness, it becomes more of a thing of, like, gambling. Like, do you want to... Do you know if he's about to hit you next turn? Or do you think you can get in, like, one more Megiddo Lown before yeah. he hits you and yeah. then you guard? Yeah. So I actually like that. Mm. Yeah, and not to say that Persona 5 does it, does it wrong. It, it's just my, my main concern is essentially just, like, without that message, getting hit by just, like, a super strong attack you didn't know it was coming sucks. Yeah. And I think that that message does sort of remove a bit of the... The strategy and tension, H- having it be delayed like the way that Persona Five does, does greatly improve that. Uh, yeah. I, it was just the first example that I, that I thought of. I just think it's a good example of why I really like the future system. Yeah, no. I, as much as I am not really into the combat of that game, uh, the future system is super cool. Mm-hmm. And Certainly. it's something and I, I, it's something I found myself and missing I might, a lot. I might, I might, I might try out the first game, like the definitive edition, because of that. Uh, and I might, and I might end up getting into it. I wouldn't say I'm really like bashing on the series, but like, even though I'm saying I don't like it, there's a chance that I could change my mind. Hmm. It's true. Get into it. It's it's absolutely not a perfect series, but I, I think that there is a to me there's an emotion and a passion behind it from the team at Monolith Soft that I have not felt with another JRPG and a lot of times not with other games that I love so much. So even though, especially one, even though it kind of stumbles and trips every once in a while, it's it's just such a a lovingly crafted experience. I, I absolutely adore it. Uh, and I, I had been intending to, to, to kind of not talk about it too much until we got to like uh, number one since it was rhino's number one but but i guess we kind of laid everything it's out on the fine. table here yeah, that's totally that's fine. fine but no. uh, I, yeah it's a gorgeously crafted story the combat's definitely an acquired taste but anyone who has like a passing interest in wasting away and perhaps because it's a long it's a long game it is a long yeah. game I, uh 
yeah and wasting it's... away like a year playing through the story it's well worth it mm -hmm. uh the characters are well developed and you can easily become emotionally attached to any one of them yeah for sure mm -hmm. yeah and that's and like it... the thing that uh most of these long rpgs like strive to do mm -hmm. well because mm -hmm. if you don't because the characters really drive everything in those rpgs so if you don't care about them then yeah. like it kind of removes everything yeah it, it's just such a master class in world build, building and especially as someone who's played through it uh, several times uh, i've like realized as i've been moving forward how good it is at foreshadowing some of the like the craziest shit that like happens in this like wild like story is like laid out to you right in front of you and you can't really see it until everything's already like coming together it's it's super good i enjoyed the game a lot i still need to finish it and the cutscenes are done really well. That's kind of why I made the joke as it's, it's a visual novel because most <laughs> of the time it's it's basically oh uh, just finish the cutscene, walk fifty feet in yeah, front of you. Oh, are, it's another cutscene. There are another yeah. moments, a lot of moments like that where you'll just walk cutscene and it's like all right, walk to the next area and just another cutscene immediately, which is sometimes yeah. frustrating, but. Yeah. I think, I think it's less of an inconvenience and more of like a, a nice repeating joke or motif. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, it, it just has it has so much like weird jank that like I know is annoying like that that I still love. Like the fact that everyone screams like different slogans and catchphrases uh, in the names of moves. So every battle yeah. just ends up being like a yelling match of all these moves you're using constantly and like I've heard a million it's times. Beautiful. God, mm -hmm. Xenoblade would not be the same without it. Uh, I, I was just gonna say, it feels like the cutscenes are very heavy in the the beginning stages of the game, and then they kind of slow out a little bit yeah. in the later sections of the game. It, it does have a fantastic beginning, though, of like setting the stage, and it is a little cutscene heavy, and then it does a really good job of like essentially mm -hmm. prepping you and showing this is what the stakes are, this is what your goals are, these are who these characters are, go. Mm. Yeah, like once you get to like the second big area i guess like the second area of the game i, I don't know how to, else to really subscribe it subscribe it <laughs> subscribe to the channel <laughs> how to describe it um but like when you you reach the plains you're just like oh this is just a giant open area now time to explore and reach the next cutscene mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, so I guess with that point, uh, do you want to go next, Daniel, with your second favorite? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I, as everyone else has mentioned already, uh, this year hasn't really seen a release of modern games that really have. Uh, I, I guess, with the exception of Xenoblade Chronicles, um, in my opinion, that are that are particularly uh, inspiring, uh, whether story wise and stuff. Uh, but for number two, I definitely would have gone with a game that just came out 1.0. It was an early access called uh, Risk of Rain 2, which is the uh, three-dimensional sequel to the two-dimensional Risk of Rain. Um, I've been wanting to pick that up. Mm, I, yeah, I saw that. It's like, on my list. Not even like a, the beta was like a year. Not the beta. The early access was like a year ago. But yeah, it just came out. Yeah. Um, absolutely fantastic little game and uh, also an excellent time waster. Yeah, uh, I've played it. Yeah, it's really fun. Great, it's a it's a great little game to uh, make you have that sort of power fantasy of being unstoppable. Eventually, I, I guess the the main attraction for it is uh, there this the whole uh, system I guess revolves around uh, the storm in the game, and it's not like the lore. It's just I guess sort of a um, just a way to get your blood pumping. Uh, that's slowly building up. There's a timer in the top right, and as the game progresses, it slowly gets harder. Um, and it'll start off uh, first with difficulty drizzle um, and then go on to like downpour and whatnot. Uh, but then they have like the more intense, once you're about 30 minutes into a run, if you've taken that long, um, it'll have the intense things where I'm coming after you, I know where you are. Um, and the final difficulty um, description, even though it does continue to get difficult, is just ha 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 over and over yeah. again. Yeah. And it definitely feels that way. Um, and, and it's a great way to encourage you to get through levels as fast as possible. Um, the game focuses on uh, an exploration of these randomly generated stage. I should say, not just say randomly generated. They're the same stage, but various significant aspects of it are changed each time you play through. 
Um, like semi-generated, semi-random? Mm -hmm. No, think of it like um, stage one's always the same stage one, but there are different locations that are connected or disconnected or not open or gotcha. open. Or like the entire, um, in some stages, the entire central area might be missing or something like that. Or gotcha. a different part of the there. So there's that. Um, and uh, you progress through the stages by opening up chests and whatnot. Uh, and nothing, you don't get any new abilities or anything like that. Well, I suppose there is one thing called an equipment slot, which grants you like an additional ability of some sort. Uh, but the main focus of exploring each area is to open up chests to get uh, essentially what are passive items that uh, improve your character in significant ways. And some of these are rather, um, what's the word, non not nonchalant, but uh, they're rudimentary, I suppose. There are simple things like deal more damage to... Um, to bosses that one's uh armor piercing rounds one's called uh old and they, they, they're all like cool cutesy semi cutesy semi weird items like there's an item called old guillotine um and its purpose is it makes elites die um earlier dealing damage to them but then they have an item called um called what is it uh it's not old faithful it's a it's a little stuffed bear i always call it the stuffed bear because that's what it is whenever i play with um my good friend justin what is it? It's called Tougher Times, is what it is. And it um, has a percent chance to where whenever you take damage, you just don't take damage at all. Um, and so they have a bunch of different passives that affect um, your character and uh, in those sort of like simplistic ways um, that slowly build up over time. And you can pick up multiple copies of these items as well. So if you pick up another Tougher Times, the chance that you don't take damage increases. Hmm. Um, and so those are the more minuscule effects, but then they have greater ones, like uh, one of my favorites is ukulele, which is description is his music was electric. Uh, um, and it mod modifies your attack to where it does uh, like chain lightning to enemies. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's very satisfying. You definitely start off very like slow and weak and eventually you're, you're doing tr like trick flips all around the map, um, wiping out waves of enemies, which I think is the me second main interest is um, it, slowly throughout the stage as difficulty increases enemies start dealing more damage and there are more enemies that spawn and uh, furthermore there are different enemies that spawn um, for example if you get to I believe to the well like I think it's stage 4 is one of the times you can appear uh, you, when you get there there might be the snail enemies that shoot artillery shells at you out, out their backs um, but if you get there at a later difficulty if you're like I'm at coming at I'm coming after you difficulty um, uh, there's a boss called Magma Worm, and it'll just start spawning normally as a weaker enemy that just appears in the map if you take too long to get to that location. Mm, it's hilarious. It's very funny, um, and it's just wildly enjoyable for that reason. It's just mowing down waves and waves of enemies is sort of like the objective. While well, you're desperately searching through these ruins to um, gain materials to upgrade your character so you can uh, ultimately defeat the final boss at each stage. And each stage, you manually choose when you want to fight the boss when you find the teleporter, which takes you to the next stage. Um, and you have a certain timer. You don't have a timer, but you have to stay within um, the area, this area until the teleporter is charged, and you have to kill the boss, and then you're able to move on to the next stage. Mm -hmm. And I don't. I think I've only ever beaten the game once because it's belligerently hard, of course. Um, uh, I, I don't doubt yeah, that. It's one, of, it's one of those, like, keep trying until you get it kind of games. Certainly. And there are tried and true um, uh, methodologies on how to like beat the game well. There's like, uh, like you shouldn't necessarily explore all of the region, um, just explore it as much as you can. Um, but as soon as you find the teleporter, you should probably get out of there. But then again, some people find a lot of success by scouring the entire place just efficiently and getting all the items and then yeah. just going to the next stage buffed up us out. Um, but the game definitely doesn't encourage you to do that. There is, in fact, um, one thing in one stage, I think it's called, um, it's like Delta Point Recon or something like that. Um, and there's a special chest that always that is always there um, that's free to open as long as you arrive to that location before 10 minutes have passed. And it always has an item in it called the Prion Accumulator, which is essentially just a um, the BFG from uh, from Doom. Oh, it's like that sounds out. dope as hell. Yeah, and and this is where like the combos come in because there are certain um, items that do uh, modif not modify but make more abilities vi viable I suppose. Uh, my favorite item is called I, mean, I guess one of my favorite item combinations is energy cell and prion accumulator. Prion accumulator usually has a large cooldown whenever you use it, um, but energy cell makes it to where you have multiple charges and you can pick up multiple energy cells of course. So if you're lucky, uh, especially find a 3D printer, there are 3D printers in the world that you can spend an item of the same rarity and get whatever's on the printer back. 
So you can like if you find an energy cell, you can get rid of all your common items just for an en just for a shit ton of energy cells. And with the prion accumulator, you might have 36 charges of the BFG and just mowing down waves of enemies. It's beautiful. It, yeah, it's very satisfying to uh, to play through for that reason. It it yeah, it sounds a lot to like uh, like Hades and Splunky to me. Just just a lot of those same kind of like rogue like principles. Uh, yeah, it sounds really, like really enticing. It's very. It's, it's, it's one of those. It's one of those like. You said it at the beginning. Um, it's like a time waster kind of game. Like it's not about saving progress and stuff. It's like you have mm -hmm. individual runs. Yeah, and just know? well, there's also like it. different characters you can yeah. start as as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah you go, and you unlock, and you unlock yeah. those um, through playing oh, the game, of course. Yeah. And, and it's multiplayer too, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, think it, I think it might be up to two though. No, no, no! I've oh, seen four people playing. You've seen and four, it, okay? And it scales the game as well. If you have more players, I'm pretty sure there are more chests in the world. Yeah, yeah that and the sounds. Game's hard, yeah. That's I, I definitely. I mean, we've talked about a lot of yeah. really cool games that are are, are kind of on my radar now. But I think Risk of Rain Two is sounds like it, it'll probably absolutely. Is the multiplayer it. online? Yes, it does. Yeah. It does have online multiplayer. Yeah, yeah. Then we, yeah, we might. We should probably consider all picking that up. Yeah, I would, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. It's been on my radar for a long time. Well, yeah. since it like came out, mm. it's significant. It's it's legitimately like the three D version of the first game. It's mm. they've done yeah. an excellent job of uh, porting it over into a comfortable manner. Mm. Like um, I, I usually suck at like the whole bullet hell thing, but I think it's kind of fun. Mm. Yeah, and, and there are certain playstyles that get around that sort of thing. Like you'll find yeah. 3D printers of tougher times, or you can get a shit ton of an item called infusions and whatnot. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, and beyond that, each character has. I wanted to mention this before we moved on. Um, each character has a significantly different playstyle from one another. Uh, from the uh, uh, the commando who's all about jumping around and dodging shit to maintain his health and stuff and. Uh, slowly whittling down people and then bursting them down with a burst of gunfire um, compared to my personal favorite which is a character called Rex who is a um, little robot machine that's been infested by plants uh, and his whole plot is that he has really strong abilities but his abilities damage them damage himself but on the flip side um, these abilities that also damage him heal him at the same time so you're like constantly on this uh, back and forth struggle of trying to maintain a uh, high health while dealing a lot of damage without damaging yourself too much alongside the enemies. Isn't there like certain items you can pick up like the lower your health the more damage you do or things like that? Yeah, totally. Um, uh, so, my yeah. favorite iteration of that is a, um, they're called lunar items. They're essentially like the rarest items in the game. Um, and they, uh, I guess they're theoretically the rarest items in the game. Um, uh, one of them is called Shaped Glass, and it halves your HP, but it doubles your damage. And every Lunar item has this sort of like heavily significant like Game fallback, but a, mm. yeah, but a wonderfully like fantastic uh, gotcha. return. Yeah, that's and cool. I, yeah, and these Lunar items are achieved through I think the one thing that carries over between game uh, games, which are Lunar coins, which are just random item drops from enemies. Mm. Gotcha. I'm gonna use Lunar coins to buy these Lunar gotcha. items. And I mean that's just another way that it kind of greatly changes up your experience as you're running through it because even if you're the same character doing double damage but having half health is going to absolutely change the way you tackle everything right yeah mm -hmm. totally and there and there are certain lunar items that other characters just wouldn't want to buy there's a incredibly weak character because every character has their own hp of course as well um artificer um a great character you might get shaped glass with her um and it might be a good idea especially if you're a fantastic player i'm sure it's even better um, but she's already so fragile, and she deal. She's by definition a glass cannon herself. Um, making herself weaker might not be worth the double damage. So it's sort of strategic in that sense, I suppose, as well. I, I will. I will definitely have to to pick that up. Yeah, I, I I plan on picking it up relatively soon. There's a few more other games that I plan on picking up, especially since the winter sales going on on Steam mm -hmm. and other platforms are doing their own sales as well yeah mm -hmm. so let's see i think we've gone through everybody but rhino at this point right Ooh, yeah so so what is your number two for this year number two is kind of like my nostalgia pick uh for number two i chose pokemon mystery dungeon the team dx or whatever the yeah, new one's called pokemon mystery dungeon rescue team dx yeah i'm, team, I'm glad yeah, that you picked this actually 
because I, I was thinking about earlier how that, that came out this year, and I would love an excuse to mention it. Um, I I just uh, by far my favorite Pokemon Mystery Dungeon is Explorers of Sky. Absolutely, best game, game hands down. And it's like I consider the Mystery Dungeon games as like its own standalone game. I mean, they are standalone games, but. I feel like they some of them have more compelling stories than the actual like main. Oh, la- absolutely! Main yeah, no battle. contest, yeah. no contest. Oh, yeah. I yeah, I don't really like Pokemon that much, but I can definitely see the appeal to like Mystery Dungeon as opposed mm-hmm. to the regular series. Yeah, P- Pokemon like combined with Mystery Dungeon is just such a strong combination, and I. Just yeah. even though like it's a good combination, the Mystery Dungeon series does not like need to lean on Pokemon at all, which is why there's so yeah. many other Mystery Dungeon games. Um, but just that idea of like collecting and like the battles in Pokemon are so simple that they're not super interesting as an RPG, in my opinion. Yeah, like com- competitive I mean. battles cool. are interesting, but I've, it's gotten to yeah. the point where I've gotten a little bit less interested in it. But all, all these moves become a lot more interesting in in a top-down 2D dungeon crawler because you're concerned about dealing not only killing this guy but fighting off several enemies that could be coming from several directions and you have to keep in mind the range of moves if a move hits multiple times the accuracy um, it's it's just a really really fantastic system it's just such a good dungeon crawler and even though like every time it's each dungeon layout is random there's definitely patterns you learn to see so it's like i I mean the rooms like there's not any kind of like crazy room layouts but you you definitely start developing patterns Mm -hmm. like okay and you kind of can guess where the next floor is like sometimes i'm just it's just pure luck i'll like run through all the run through all the rooms in a a dungeon level and i'm just like okay where's the where's the exit and then other times it's like oh i can i can kind of estimate guess based off the location of the room i am now if i head down and left i have a pretty good chance of getting to the the exit Mm -hmm. yeah i also kind of like the whole point of like befriending uh, other pokemon it's like it's not a guaranteed chance i can uh, like in just normal Pokemon, you just oh, you just keep throwing Pokeballs until you catch the thing you want. And no, it's like you just basically just have to keep murdering thousands of friends until you, they just decide they want to be your friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and, and one of the changes they made in Rescue Team that actually that that was not in any of the original games that I really enjoyed is you can recruit a much larger team. It used to be just four. But now I think you can have uh, like around six, seven, or maybe even eight Pokemon. Yeah, it's a large number that you can recruit. And there's also a skill that I, I think you're guaranteed to get on the main player character, where the more friends you have, the higher recruitment chance you get. So like you're picking up all these Pokemon that like, and you're not catching what you want. You're kind of just picking up like whatever you randomly get. So it gives you an excuse to see like some Pokemon you mm-hmm. might not have used before and see like what makes them dangerous and what their weaknesses are and not only that eventually you're guiding like seven of these guys through these dungeons and like you can have them all split up and like tackle like floors on their own or you can just become like this massive like army that tries to charge through everything but it's also more difficult to manage that many and it's easy to start losing them it's it's just oh, yeah, really interesting i really like they increased the the count and you can only take uh, i think three or yeah i want to say it's you can only take three characters in so if you want all those characters you have to essentially pick up whoever you get along the way so it's not just a the other games you can pick up four people yeah at a time. so in the other games it was four um but in, in this yeah in this case you, you start off with three and you can get uh, i think up to like six it probably is just by picking up mm-hmm. other characters and then of course if you finish the dungeon with them they join your team permanently so there really is yeah. kind of like a a bit of strategy of like okay I, i'm not going to be super strong when i first enter but as you go through this random dungeon you're going to build up a bit of a random team with some random allies every time and and yeah and i would say as you mentioned that there is definitely some like interestingness to the random generation as someone who is such a fan of the series, I tried to 
program the random generation that it uses. And after like seeing and kind of diving into like how complex it is, it's it it every dungeon feels very unique. Like some dungeon might have like a lots of small rooms with long hallways mm-hmm. interconnecting it. They might have just huge long rooms with like short hallways. The like the way that they kind of make every dungeon manage to feel different from each other, and also the fact that they're different on every playthrough makes it a, a lot of fun. Yeah, but there is also a pattern to it. Like I've played. And I know the. I don't know if they changed the generation like in the different games. Mm-hmm. They could have literally been using the same generation for every single title. I would never know. Uh, but I've played so many of them and played them for so long. Like I think I have, and I don't. I know the DS doesn't like have like a counter for how much play time mm-hmm. you have. But I, I've I've easily put almost like a thousand hours in Explorers of Sky. Yeah. I completed the story, I did the whole epilogue stuff, I did like the continuation of stories of everything. I'm I'm I don't think I 100 percent the game, but like I was I'm pretty damn close through that whole game. I played that so much. Yeah. Yeah, Mystery Team Red Mystery Team and Red Rescue Mystery Team, Blue Blue Rescue Mystery Team. I those are not the names remotely. <laughs> Mystery Dungeon, <laughs> Red Rescue Team, Mystery Dungeon, Blue Rescue Team, the originals on the Game Boy Advance and DS, were the first in the mm-hmm. series, and they're somehow still the second best games in the, in the series. They're missing a lot of the really nice quality of life changes, and they're not perfect. Uh, Sky is still the best, but what they have done is just taken some of the best features from the newer games which, although not as good, uh, definitely improved the quality of life and made dungeon exploring easier. Um, mm-hmm. And that that makes Mystery Dungeon uh, Rescue Team DX like easily the second best game in the series. It's it's just oh, the yeah, first far. games with a lot of really nice gameplay changes. Um, if they happen to remake the Explorers games, Explorer of Sky, like DX or whatever. That will, with, like without any doubt, yeah, without any doubt, if they remake those games with the similar quality of life changes, th- that would be my game of the year, oh, hands easy. down. Like one of my favorite games of all time. I still absolutely adore Explorers of Sky. It's it's such a good game. I don't remember the story a ton, but I remember like playing that game hours on end, and it was just like, yeah, I would get stuck because like. I wasn't high enough level, and I would just basically be stuck. I'd basically kind of be like soft lock in a certain area because I couldn't return. Yeah, I would just have to basically just grind levels in the low level, just like the first few floors, and then get knocked out, and keep the levels, and just grind up to like get to like the boss or something. Uh, I remember playing it with like kind of with my dad. Like he would like we would just kind of trade my DS between each other. And at one point he like woke up, he woke me up like for school and he was super tired and he was like, don't even try to get past this next level. Like I spent up way too long, like trying to get through it. And it was Ant Plains, which is like pretty damn difficult. It's like the, mm-hmm. the thunder area where you get like jumped by enemy Pokemon. And I remember managing yeah. to beat it. Um, I don't think I, my brain tells me my first try. My memory says it's my first try, but I highly doubt that. Uh, but I remember getting through it and just being so excited and being like, Dad, look, I did it. And all I'm saying is he's never played video games the same again. <laughs> so I feel like <laughs> I ruined him. But that's a very oh. fun memory I have of Explorers of Sky. God, yeah. it's, it's such a fantastic game. And it, like the gameplay is still really solid there. And if you're if you're remotely interested in, interested in getting into the series, um, Rescue Team DX is a fantastic place to start do we want to run through our, our our top games i think um i should go last uh risk of rain okay. 2 is probably the the best game that i've played this year other than perhaps xenoblade chronicles but i didn't really think about it all that much i haven't played it i don't think in a while i've been playing through it with uh wizard here uh and i figured i just wanted to go through not not in as much detail but um a couple of honorable mentions i suppose okay. that i really enjoyed that released this year regardless yeah i, I yeah. think any honorable mentions i had were, were covered pretty much by by rhino i mean i'm glad that he brought up pokemon mystery dungeon yeah. spelunky 2 for sure and and a persona 4 golden even though i haven't played it yet definitely would recommend it yeah definitely 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 go play that you guys need to do it 
One more honorable uh, yeah. mention I think would be satisfactory. I, I did really oh, yeah. enjoy that. that. That was one I was going to mention actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's like right now it's got some. There's some really cool shit to do there. But if there's any game that I would recommend, like keep an eye on in the future, I think that game's going to go some cool places. Mm-hmm. And I know it's technically. I mean, it came out this year in early access, mm-hmm. so it's like, I I know you did a review on it and uh we kind of like stopped playing it since that mm. but it's actually come out with some more stuff yeah it, it, so it's I, it's been even though i haven't touched it since it's it's a game that's still been on my mind sorry i think we no. that, that that's it for honorary yeah, yeah. mentions feel free it, to yeah exactly if you want to start us off with your your favorite game this year yeah my favorite game that came out this year is gotta be persona 5 royal it's quickly become one of my favorite games just in general actually despite not liking rpgs it helped kind of break me into the genre a little more uh well rpg is like turn based RPGs. yeah i'm cool with, i'm cool with stuff like fallout or skyrim or something like mm. that those are fun even if they're buggy yeah such a great improvement on the original game which i played last year um and like going into it again, but everything's slightly different with new characters. People like Goro have a social link now. Um, the new gun mechanic is such a small feature, oh but God, it's like yeah. a godsend. Yeah, absolutely. Like with your ammo refilling after every fight, rather than it just like being empty for the whole palace once you run yeah. out. Yeah, thank God. It's so many great quality of life changes. Um, like, another thing, another really small thing that helps out in the long run is after every social link meeting, they'll call you on the phone, and it just it's just another chance to get a couple more points so you can finish that social link faster. Mm-hmm. Such a great feature. Like, everything has been streamlined after Persona 5, which was already a really good game. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the new semester, like, that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it an epilogue, necessarily. But, like, the new semester that takes place after the end of the original game is so good. One of the most interesting storytelling devices I've seen used in the game, honestly. Because it questions everything you've done up to that point. I'll try not to say anything that's too telling. What it does to the characters makes you question, like, whether you should actually keep pursuing the goal. I've seen a lot of people take like a false ending because they they just legitimately liked what that did, which is super strange to me because it felt like really wrong and off-putting. It's so compelling to see. And like the final battle, so cool now. It it tops the original final fight. Yeah, I'm surprised to hear that honestly because I, I did enjoy the final battle. Yeah, it, the the new final battle tops that like by a long shot for me. It's such an enjoyable experience if you enjoyed the original Persona Five, and it just like is so much better in every way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Persona Five is one of my favorite games. Period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same here. And Royal is just like that much better. I like that's the one thing I want to emphasize is just like. Persona 5, really good, but Persona 5 Royal is, to me, like, with all the quality of life changes and this new bit of story at the end, which, in my opinion, really carries the plot, like, to a new direction because of that ending. Um, yeah, it's so much better to me. Yeah, not that Persona 5 was rushed or anything by any means. No, you just, no, when for you're sure. When you're working on a game of that size within that time frame i definitely think that there were some things that can only be kind of addressed in after the games are released and so many people people have played it and persona 5r takes you know what a lot of people thought was a masterpiece and really just polishes it up to a whole other level it's yeah. it, even another if you played is, the original I, I still highly think it's it's a great thing to jump into another thing it adds is the thieves den which is pretty fun uh it's got like in-game trophies pretty much like as opposed to the achievements and stuff so it's just another thing to do for fun um you can decorate it how you want you can play cards with other phantom thieves which is always fun uh it's actually a really interesting card game uh which is surprising you'd think it would just be something simple but no it's actually a cool game so i ended up playing more of that than i thought i would because it's just fun um is that the game that we played that one time yeah, actually. 
Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, did you guys play it in like tabletop simulator or something? Yeah, we played it in tabletop. That's, that's yeah, we were cool. just messing around in tabletop, and I ended up explaining it. It's it plays kind of like Uno, but with a regular deck of cards, if that makes sense. Hmm. So it just being able to just randomly play Uno with the Phantom Thieves is kind of funny. Literally all so. I asked for, I'm pretty sure. Um, that yeah. and being able to fuck Ryuji, which didn't get added, but hopefully Persona 5 Royal 2 will address that. <laughs> Maybe. Royal 2. Royal 2. Can't wait for that one. Yeah, so that's that's my top one game here. Well, we kind of yeah. covered mine also, already. Also, just to mention, like, I, yeah, like, as... I forgot to add in this, like, as someone who doesn't like turn-based RPGs, I actually ended up, like, maxing out Arsen, like, putting a bunch of good moves. Like, I got everyone in the Phantom Thieves to level 99, like, all 10 of them. Like, I played the shit out of it. It was super good. Beautiful. Yeah, if you've somehow missed out on Persona 5, um, or finished it and you're looking for something different i, I think persona 5 r is yeah. worth your time either way yeah no, if you it, miss persona 5 just play royal I, I know we've already kind of talked about it but if you just want to kind of sum up your points and and i guess announce it officially brandon if you want to go through xenoblade xenoblade definitive edition that's my number one it's a great story uh great music gameplay is okay sometimes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. um I think that's how I'd rate those games. Yeah. Cause, the like, story they definitely seems super is. interesting, but the gameplay just seems like kind of yeah. It's if you, if the gameplay is not your style, I do recommend just like sitting down and watching like the movie cutscenes. Be I, some, like, no, the gameplay can definitely be overcome. It's not, and it's yeah, not. No, like, I could get through it if I wanted, but like, yeah. yeah. The definitive edition has also added the addition of like a casual mode, which lets you kind of play yeah, a yeah. little m- more fast and loose. So if you aren't super interested in like, you don't want to do side quests, you don't want to fight unique monsters, if you just want to like literally go to the beeline for the end, you can easily do that. And the opposite is also true. If you've played it before and there's an expert mode where you can specifically limit your level and ch- like make the game slightly more difficult and like really challenge yourself and kind of push the combat system to its limit. Or you can just top lock everything. Also, that too. also, you don't have to beat the game to like play the stories connected. It's a completely separate optional thing. Like it's just in the store. It's like in the main menu. You can choose to access that instead of like the main story. So you don't have to finish the whole story just to play well, the yeah. continuation yeah, future, of the future story. Connected. If for whatever reason you haven't future played it yet, yeah. uh, I-, I have not played Future Connected yet, so I can't like speak to the like quality of it like yeah. i don't know if it's Short worth the 60 dollar price of admission if you've played the original and just are there for the feature connected my my guess is it's probably a neat bonus but i don't know if it's worth the price of admission alone i have no idea how long it is like what was what was um torna xenoblade torna yeah torna Torna's i don't know how long torna Tor- Tor- yeah, torna pretty much is a standalone, a standalone game uh, you could just buy that it, and play i think it probably does standalone mm. a little bit easier than and it's easier to recommend than than mm. just buying it for only That's feature fair. connected it's got the cool battle theme too yeah. added that in it's yeah. nice there you go um I mean, furthermore, isn't, like, the new, new release of Xenoblade, like, the first time it's ever appeared on console? There's, like, the there's the great graphical improvement, too. Well, it's, it's, it's it originally like appeared on Wii. It's the first time it's appeared on console, a console that doesn't uh, suck. Okay. Uh, not to diss on the Wii yeah. too much, but the not a great JRPG. look way different. Yeah. Yeah. My, my only Is it real... in the Xenoblade 2 engine? <sighs> I don't believe... I think... I don't... I actually have no idea. I think idea. it might be. It, it very well... Actually, the the more I think about it, I think it really is in the Xenoblade One engine. They've just they really have just ported it. Essentially, the only thing they've really changed is they've changed the character models. Like the environments themselves and other characters have not changed a huge amount, um, which is a I will say is a little off putting to me. The fact that like Shulk and, and Gang are so different compared to like some of the Napon and the environments around, which have definitely received like a glow up, but not a complete kind of rehaul of the look compared to the new models, but at the there is some models that you could tell like they put more effort into certain models than others. Yeah, so sometimes it can look any game. Yeah, sometimes it can That's look true, a little though. off. It's it's a it's a really gorgeous game, uh, but not necessarily for for the graphics. No, yeah, I mean, it it still looks great. I mean, well, it looks 
great to me. It, at least. It's it's still <laughs> incredibly fun to explore, and things like there are some absolutely gorgeous views. Um, it's just not like the pinnacle of like graphical achievement. It doesn't have any crazy no. looking lighting gotcha. or super superb draw distance uh, or anything either but it's just no it's not like, it's not the type of game it is though mm. I, it's most you mostly play it for the story and like the character development and things yeah. like that yeah they, they did a really good job of just capturing this the huge scope of living on those titans but but we've already talked about yeah we've already talked about it quite yeah. a bit so we'll probably move on uh let's see so wizard you're up next because uh daniel said he wanted to go yeah left. that's true um so my game of the year uh, kind of surprised me. Uh, I ended up going with Hades. Um, that ah, makes sense. I absolutely fell in love with this game. Uh, and, and I love Xenoblade. But the reason it didn't quite make number two is because I, I played Xenoblade kind of off and on throughout this year. And it's a game, I, as I mentioned, I fell in love with when I first played it on the 3DS. But here it was just revisiting something I really enjoyed. When I played Hades this year, I, I fell fell in love with a brand new game. It just was a much more powerful experience to me. I've beaten it, I want to say like 12 times now, and I've gone back to it here and there, and there's still so much shit I have not explored. Uh, for anyone who is not aware, it's it's essentially a, a roguelike where your, your main goal is to escape from Hades. Uh, and you, you go through, I think it's like four areas with one of like a set of weapons. And as you go through, you're getting various uh, temporary upgrades. You're getting boons from gods that increase some of your damage or give you some new effects. You're taking back treasure with you to, it's not the castle of Hades, but the house of Hades. And you're upgrading like some of your stats, like you're getting a little bit more HP to help you out with the next run. Uh, it's just, it has... It's a, it's a roguelike, and everything every time you go, you're starting off at the beginning again. And so at the end, you're way more powerful than you were when you started. But the sense of progression that it has, which is not something that a roguelike typically has, is mind-blowing. And not just from like the, the idea that, okay, now I have 5% more health. There's a narrative sense of progression that I have never seen in a roguelike, period. That is absolutely fantastic. Like, while other games might have you exploring different areas, rather than exploring, like, the depths of Tartarus here, you're kind of just exploring relationships with, like, random characters you kind of enjoy speaking with. Not not to say that there aren't some really cool things to discover, but it's just... God, it's just such an enjoyable time. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely had some other friends that have sung the praises of this game. I haven't picked it up myself yet, but I definitely should because I'm into the I, kind of I games. highly recommend it. I, I played it's it on Switch, phenomenal. and it is just so good. Mm. I plan on picking it up at some point. I think uh, I'll get it on Steam because it's where I play a lot of games like that. Yeah. Switch would make a lot of sense, though, I think. So. Well, the thing is, is that they're having cross save. Yeah, now, I was gonna so say the oh. they just recently save. implemented it. So now Switch and, and Steam, sh I think they should have crossplay now. If I'm thinking correctly, they should either now or soon. Yeah, or, or it's coming out relatively soon, so you can essentially pick up your progress. But it's just, it's the kind of game where I can sit down and do a whole run of it, uh, just kind of like nonchalantly, or I can sit down and do 20 runs of it in a day. It's just so enjoyable, and every time it feels so unique. Mm. That's how I... Well, I wouldn't say it feels so like, unique and stuff like that, but that's how I feel with Sonic Mania. Like, I can just... I can just do a bunch of runs of that game. It's so fun to me. God, I, I just... I love it. Like, I'm still discovering new abilities, and there are still some aspects of the weapons I have unlocked. There are some characters I haven't unlocked. There's, like, a secret boss I haven't beaten. Um, there's a heat system once you essentially beat the game where you can slightly adjust it to make runs more difficult and the level of difficulty that you can increase it to is unbelievable like there's still so much more I could like so much higher I could climb in terms of difficulty so many more challenges I could try to tackle now that I've, I've beaten the main like sort of campaign so many times and, and there's like there's areas that are unlocked only if you have a certain level of like difficulty modifiers 
active, which I, I haven't been able to get into because the difficulty modifiers are pretty crazy. I, there's just so much shit that I have not yet discovered, and I've beaten this game 12 times. It's it's There's just so much stuff, and it's it never gets old to me. Mm. Uh, I should. I think it should be stated for the audience as well. As um, like other rogue roguelikes, like perhaps like Isaac, um, the game intends for you to beat it multiple mm-hmm. times. As yeah. Well. Um, mm-hmm. And each time you beat it, it, it builds upon the narrative um, uh, that Wizard was yeah, describing. Yeah, it, it, it really is fantastic. Like it, it's not just like okay, I beat it once. Now every time after this is just like for fun. Like it, it, once you beat it, you are not done. You are constantly getting like more stuff available to you. Mm, it's very good. Very good. Do you have anything else to say for the game? It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> I, I absolutely adore it. Also, everybody's really hot, and that's really cool. Uh, I think that is it for my my Haiti spiel. It's just really good. That's right. I wanted to give a spiel about it as well. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I I didn't really have a number one game uh, because I knew Wizard was going to cover Hades, and I'm an absolute uh, super giant fanboy myself. Oh, I suppose not for him. He enjoys Hades a lot, but uh, I think the main attractor for me for Hades is it has fantastic gameplay. Um, with all these multiple different building aspects, each time you it, you beat the game the first time, you think, okay, I'm just going to replay the game again. Then they introduce the heat system, um, and then they reduce, introduce weapon aspects. It's all it's all very impressive, and um, it, it never stops being interesting as you yeah. keep playing it. Certainly, uh, but the main draw for the game for me, and uh, for any super giant game really, um, is just the amount of personality it has. Every character feels like a real person. In, uh, the voice actors that they picked, especially for um, this game, are wonderful. Oh my god! Yeah, fantastic. Uh, it, mm-hmm. They they embody perfectly what the gods they represent as well. Because you're speaking, um, you get um, gifts from all the other uh, Olympus gods and stuff. But the ones that you're more familiar with in the game are referred to as Chthonic gods, which I don't know if that's real Greek mythology, but. Um, uh, are all of the gods that sort of exist in the underworld. And so you have um, uh, the character uh, like Megar, one of the, one of the Furies, uh, that we're talking about the meme. Um, she's one, a wonderful character, very intense and stuff. The voice actor for it performed perfectly. Uh, you have the characters of the dead. Um, one of the popular ones called Achilles. Uh, and he holds that sort yeah, he has sort of, he holds that sort of like regretful sentiment that he did at the end of his life um, as well. Uh, and he sort of like has that sort of uh, calm complacentness that uh, humans obtain whenever they go to the underworld in Greek mythology as well. Uh, your, fa- um, your father in the game, Hades himself, is very stern uh, and methodical, uh, as one should be when they're controlling uh, the undead. It's just great. It's wonderful. Um, and exploring these characters uh, ties into the gameplay perfectly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of my favorite instances is, I'm glad you brought that up because it reminded me, so whenever you're getting boons from gods, sometimes you'll get what are called duo boons, which are essentially uh, special boons that are a combination of the power of two gods, uh, which not only like merge two different like gameplay styles in a really interesting way and kind of change up how you play, but also you hear these gods like interact with each other and pick each other apart and like shit on each other, and it's so interesting to like see all these like uh, essentially these assholes just like kind of making fun of each other and you could you really get the sense that like th- th- this like family of greek gods is just kind of barely like being held together mm. it's incredibly motley mm. I think it's, it's yeah it's, it. it's really good that's fair um alongside that i do have to um say that uh along with that personality super giants just personality written in every single one of its games i heavily suggest um anyone picking up its previous uh previous iterations as well like uh transistor bastion and um pyre pyre being particularly one of my favorites it's the first time they introduced a bunch of uh, really interesting characters but that didn't come out this year so we'll be discussed mm-hmm. later um, I just wanted to throw out a few game names that I really enjoyed that came out this year that I didn't get a chance to play that much, but are fairly interesting, in my opinion. Uh, one of them was named earlier, uh, which was Satisfactory. Mm. Um, fantastic little game. Uh, it's 
I, I, want, I want to talk about um, a, an, another game, though, before I go into it, which is uh, Factorio. It's 1.0 drop, drop this year. Um, uh, and it's absolutely perfect. It is, by definition, in my opinion, like a perfect game. Uh, and, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best game, I should say, either. It's just um, what, it, what it strove to do, it did, I think as good as anyone else can i don't know if much can be improved upon it other than perhaps new mechanics of some sort but it's the perfect amount of catharsis of designing uh a factory um that fits whatever plan that you build it's very interesting in that uh the fact that it's isometric compared to satisfactory um produces a challenge of making something that fits in one small area uh and in spite of that, you're able to create these freakishly ugly factories that mystic mystically work regardless, um, which is a bit of a charm that I feel like is lost in Satisfactory. Mm. Yeah, I would uh, definitely agree with that sentiment. Mm -hmm. But I think it's wrong to compare Satisfactory directly to Factorio. Just saying that it's a 3D Factorio, I don't feel like it does it mm. justice. It, um, yeah. it definitely has its own tone, and it definitely has its own sort of like um way of progressing in it and that's, that's an awful way of saying it i it, you definitely can't don't get the same emotion out of satisfactory that you do in factorio yeah. but satisfactory is definitely as the name implies very satisfying to mm do -hmm. um both of them fantastic titles uh, i can't suggest one over the other um uh satisfactory will probably become just as innately complex and interesting as factorio is once it's finally reached full mm -hmm. release but heavily suggest both of those um does anyone have anything to say on that or i can move on to the next uh, game that no i, I mean i think you pretty much covered everything i i think they're they're both mm -hmm. kind of similar games uh on like the surface level but they're i think they're very different in like how they achieve what they're going for and i think if you're interesting interested in either of them uh, i think both of them are are super cool definitely worth checking out and, and just because you like you have factorio doesn't necessarily mean that you like don't need to try satisfactory and vice versa mm -hmm. they're yeah different games at heart um despite having very yeah. similar sort of like gameplay concepts and, and just to add to that tone comment that you made i the, the biggest difference to me is um like satisfactory is made by the people who did goat simulator so a lot of that kind of like humor is there just like with like the I, i'm not sure quite how to describe it. like the tools that you have are very kind of almost like cartoonish um and like the mm. the kind of like crazy technology you have with like hyper tubes and like mm. sliding down conveyor belts it, it has a very kind of like almost like whimsical feeling to it that i really enjoy yeah that's a very it's very fantastic in that especially with how you can like there's like gel pads oh, i think yeah, my favorite thing is that you can put up um conveyor belts in any fucking orientation that you oh, yeah. want you oh, can yeah. make absolute conveyor belt spaghetti and meatballs the nastiest Beautiful. shit it's fantastic we're um so yeah both great games heavily yeah. successful uh did anyone else have a comment perhaps or uh, I think I'm the okay. other, other thing yeah. I would add is satisfactory is where the programmer in me absolutely comes out because all of my machines are the nastiest looking messes. But every time I'm like, that works, it's 100 percent efficient. <laughs> Not pretty, but efficient. Oh, such a, such an enjoyable experience. So beyond those two games, uh, another game that I wanted to shout out real quick was uh, a cute little roguelike. There's been a lot of roguelikes. It's yeah, fairly it's, it's been a really good genre, year for roguelikes between like new shit like Hades breaking new ground and Spelunky 2 just like stick into like what works super well about the original. Right, just being better Spelunky yeah. really. Right? Um, in any case, the other roguelike that I wanted to mention was uh, is a cute little like wizard um, up, I suppose called Noida uh it's an adorable little game where the whole concept is uh you're trying to like dig into this mountain to achieve uh i don't know exactly what the term is but the objective is essentially to become ultimately rich uh and just uh, get a bunch of money essentially to learn magic to convert shit into gold um uh and as you're progressing through the game uh the whole i don't think you even unlock anything but the whole like objective is 
uh, getting different wands. But beyond that, these wands come preloaded with spells on them and different effects. Uh, and you can unload those spells from the wands and put them into new wands that have different effects. So like some wands will shoot out multiple different spells at once, but they have a long recharge time before you can use them. Um, it's very neat in that aspect. Uh, and the real traction for the game to me is this customizability. And everything's, uh, I don't think it's voxel, but everything's pixelated uh, and everything interacts in some way. So like, um, so uh, what's an example? Uh, oil will set fire to wood and stuff. And you have like all this simple stuff like that. Um, but further beyond that, oil makes everything slippery and it works for enemies and for you as well. Um, water, water will make things wet. Uh, but going back to the spell customizability is uh, where I think the main attraction is where you have all these unique effects, like simple ones, like you just cast an arcane bolt, but other ones where you spawn water and then there are ones where you combine it, they'll get an effect like put these two effects together and now you have an arcane boat that tra trails water behind it and they can get even more violent than that where you switch it up to where this arcane bolt shoots out and then when it hits a wall it shoots out 16 million buzz saws or whatever um it's very interesting in that sort of customizability and that's why i think it should be i think it's an, an eye should be placed on it if anyone's interested in that kind of uh personality yeah. in a game and i will say it's it's a it's a kind of pixel based but like with so many pixels and so much detail like the particle effects of like explosions and like falling liquid or like dirt it's it's surprisingly like a really gorgeous game uh despite mm, the fact that it's very pretty it's kind of you know pixel based which i think is a lot of things uh something that i think a lot of people might write off yeah it's it seems super fantastic it's also been on my radar as well mm. and uh there's the there's one last meme i guess op option i, I want to mention because i just think it's a, a hilarious game that someone's trying to make uh that has received i believe little to no negative review uh but just so it's in other people's minds is uh, a, a cute little dark souls em up called little witch no better uh, and all, all I really need to say about that is you play as a, a little witch named Nobetta, and it has uh, Dark Souls-like combat and interaction. Uh, it's, it's hilarious, not necessarily because um, the game itself is comical, but that the setting that revolves around the game and the, the plot of the game itself is so ridiculous that it's uh, beyond entertaining. Hmm. I have not heard of this, but it does look quite cute. Yeah, it it lo it looks like it should be illegal, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. No, that that's that's a bit of an exaggeration, but um it's very Japanese. Uh I some it's it's a playable game and it's very fun gameplay wise. Uh I think an, another adorable aspect is um the uh the creator of the game is Japanese as well and he's like Hey, I'm just trying to make this game, and he's like speaks in broken English sometimes, if I remember rightly. Um, but yeah, that's probably older versions of the game as well. But I just wanted to, to put put that out there, just because I think it's hilarious. I think other people should be aware of it um, and how hilarious it is. Mm. Yeah, so there, that that's that it. did remind me. How of... much of the game is like done right now? I have I have no idea, quite frankly. Yeah, it's another game that's in early access, access right as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, but I think, I think it's a significant part of it. I think it's, um, definitely has a fair bit of development left going into it, but I guess that's part uh, of the reason why, why I'm I reading the before. early access notes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. it's been in development for nearly three years right now. Decent amount of time. Yeah. And I am reading there as well. It says it's expected to take about one or two more years before it takes a full release. Yeah. It's not an expensive game, about $10 and there's a free demo you can download to try it out. Mm hmm. Yeah, wh while we're talking about early access roguelikes, uh, I did want to mention just uh, Rogue Legacy 2, uh, which is, I really did enjoy the first game, and although I have not played 2, I just wanted to echo, like, the sentiment the sentiment you mentioned about, like, kind of it, it being fun to, like, listen to these developers, like, talk about it. One thing that I really loved about Rogue Legacy 2, not from a gameplay pr perspective, but, like, because it's an early access and they're building it as they go based on community feedback, there's a lot of areas that are like present in the game, but not haven't been made yet. So it's just fucking hilarious to me. Like that you'll be exiting the castle and going to an area. And there's a sign that just says 
Uh, we're not done here yet. You can go in here if you want to, but there's not really anything to do. Sorry about that. It's still under construction. <laughs> it, it, I, I remember hearing um, another game podcast talk about it, and it was just so funny to me. Uh, but also kind of cool that like they're building this as they go and letting the community be like be a part of it. Um, God, this mm. has been such a good year for roguelikes. Uh, the other thing I want to shout out, just because none of us mentioned it, um, I'm not sure if anybody else played it, but Final Fantasy VII Remake was pretty cool. Oh, I, did, I didn't play it, but uh, I think it's kind of weird that the game is split up. Yeah, I, I, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it, which is why I don't have a ton to say, and I didn't put it on my uh, list. I enjoyed a little bit of what I played, uh, and I, I love what they've done with the characters, but I, I, I'm interested to see where everything goes next, even though I didn't finish it. I'm interested to see where it goes next, both in terms of like the game itself and how they're like making and releasing the game. I have no idea how that that situation is going to pan out. But I think I think to form my full opinion on a game like that, I'd have to also play the original. Mm-hmm. Which I, I have because played. it change, it changes so much that I um, I wouldn't know if it's like a good change or not. Mm. Because like that's the controversial opinion that like Bunky had. Is, uh, he was he was saying that like yeah this is a good game, but the original did this and it was better. I, I will say the character development they've done in in Seven R is leagues better than anything they did in the original purely just because there wasn't yeah. a lot um but also final fantasy 7 r i think it's my official wizard re- award for the worst side quests in a game i've played all year holy oh, shit really? they are abysmal it's like the most boring shit on the planet. Like, go to this location and check all the trash cans for a key and then return it to someone. Or go find all the cats around town. Like, it is the most boring shit imaginable. And it was miserable to do. But, like, I was like, well, I want to get it so I get this cool materia. So I guess I'll go look for cats. Oh, man. I, I think that's, that's why I got burnt out on it, honestly. Makes me wonder if the original game was like that, honestly. The original game, as far as I remember, didn't have any like a, any side quests like that. Uh, I don't even really know if it really has side quests at all. Uh, the original game is, is also on Switch and also is, is pretty cool. I have not finished it. Yeah. I think I'm about halfway through. But it's, it's just, it's an old turn-based RPG. And as much as I love turn-based RPGs and RPGs in general, it's a little rough to get through. It's all in. Well, I I think does anybody have anything else they want to mention? I think. Uh, I've mentioned all the games that I think I'd like to mention. Um, one other. Uh, I don't I don't even know if this really fits in that much, but uh, like the one game you said that we played this year, but like didn't come out. Uh, Zelda Oracle of Ages and Seasons. I also got around mm. to playing. Those games are super fun and underrated as far as Zelda games yeah. go, and. Everyone should play them because the link feature is actually really cool. You can play the games in any order and they will acknowledge that you've played the other game first. Like in the game, you'll be able to like go back to the old game after you've started the second game and get new items because like talking to people in that world will like know people in the other world and tell you to talk to them. It's cool. That sounds radically yeah, interesting. I, yeah. I, I think it's yeah, it's kind it's kind of clunky because it's two Game Boy mm-hmm. games, so it's got like a weird password system. But like, if you can get, <laughs> if you can get over that, it's like actually kind of yeah. cool. From, from what I've I've heard, it, it's they seem like pretty damn good Zelda games, honestly. Oh yeah, they're very different. Oracle of Seasons is more combat oriented, and it's a lot like the first Zelda game. Like it makes direct callbacks to it. But Oracle of uh, Ages is super puzzle yeah. like oriented. Mm-hmm. Like if you like the puzzle aspect of Zelda, this is one of the strongest games in the mm-hmm. series. Because like as you slowly get a better like control over time, the puzzles like ramp up like they ramp up like right alongside mm-hmm. you and they will test you sometimes. It's super. It, it's cool. such a damn shame that that trilogy did not get like finished and everything didn't come together. I, 
at the same time, I, I think yeah, the state that it's in right now is a trilogy, totally fine. A trilogy, like I think, would have been a little too complicated with the password system that they mm-hmm. went with. If it was like modern day, that would have been yeah. cool because uh, we wouldn't have needed to fumble around with a, like long passwords. But I think what we got was actually pretty good because um, they're all based around the three oracles that are the goddesses. There's Din and then Nehru and seasons and ages respectively and the link between them is Ferrore, who is the oracle of secrets uh she like brings the secrets across both games helps you transfer everything so i think the way it is now with like the two oracles being the games like wisdom and power you know that kind of thing and then the like the goddess of courage that you know that one being the link between the mm-hmm. two is like kind of nice considering that's the one Link has as well, so it's kind of a neat little pun almost. So at this point, we've talked about everything that we played and enjoyed this year, so I'm curious, just kind of rapid yeah. fire, what all are you guys looking forward to in the future, whether it be next year or who the hell knows in the case of Breath uh, of the Wild 2? I'm definitely looking forward to the next Halo, uh, New Zelda, uh, maybe Metroid Prime. Mm. No more heroes and Bayonetta, those yeah. games. And as we mentioned earlier, Persona 5 Strikers. Looking forward to that for oh, sure. Oh, yeah. That, that one's going to um, be good. I uh, can't wait to play that. I love Musou games. Can't wait games. for Cyberpunk 2077 to be released. <sighs> Hell yeah. <laughs> that demo yeah. that they really released. Um, uh, <laughs> Making me worried like, a little uh, bit. But <laughs> thankfully, they got a lot more time to get it done. Uh, Rhino, what's the new... Let's see, I'm trying to think. I mentioned it to you earlier. Monster Hunter Rise. Uh, yeah. Yes, that was oh, what I was yeah, about to say. I'm really Hunter, excited for it. There's dogs. That's what I'm I finally. Hope it, I hope it's a little. Uh, I hope it's a little more intuitive. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. Ca- I'm very cautiously optimistic. I'm not sure how, how exactly it'll play because the only one I've played is World, but it looks like yeah. kind of like Sekiro Monster Hunter, like with the the kind of very feudal <laughs> Japan look and the grappling hook. I, I'm I'm very excited to see yeah, how it turns we'll out. See. It, yeah. it seems cool. I I kind of want a PC release because that's I do like the Switch, but like a game like Monster Hunter, which recently has been like pushing like it looking really yeah. Pretty. I, I do I, I do get like, that. I that's want it. Yeah. yeah, with games like that, I mm. like to play them on my PC because like Monster Hunter, I like to play games like roguelikes and stuff on the mm-hmm. Switch because like they're based on like individual runs, not like a long overarching yeah mm-hmm. i'm playthrough. curious so like you can pick how it up, it play it, up. And, like get back to what you're doing especially because it's it's not like a numbered game and it seems quite different from what they've done previously so i'm curious if it'll it mm-hmm. might be more single player focused i, I don't know how it, uh, it'll end up turning out but uh yeah. after world i'm i'm really excited to see the direction they're taking uh I'm that's true. Yeah. I highly doubt it'll be. So I just want. Though. I just want more Monster Hunter on the PC. That's like an intuitive mm. game, basically, is what I'm. Yeah, because a lot of the yeah, other yeah, ones yeah, are totally. on like Mon- DS or something, which is yeah fine, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as much as I like World, it's kind of a mess mm. when it comes to doing anything in that game. They just like mm. made it so complicated needlessly. Yeah, th- like yeah every, it's just, everything it's just like takes nothing. like yeah. three there's a lot of really cool to. shit you can do now, but it, it just needs to be cleaned up and made a little bit easier to like do do shit. Yeah, there's mm. st- I mean they're still updating mm. the game, so like who knows I, they could I they could just like I yeah. doubt they'd do it because it's Capcom, but like if they did like a complete overhaul, overhaul of yeah. like some of the systems in that game, I would be so. I wonder thankful. if they'll do another expansion for World because it's still so huge and Iceborne did so well. <laughs> Yeah, but, who knows? I'm not sure. Like, well, like I think layered armor, like the, you guys were talking about earlier before this podcast started, is like a new mm. thing. Like they're still doing. Stuff. Yeah, for sure. Especially mm-hmm. with the new like Monster Hunter movie crossover. Damn, mm. I'm so upset. You guys are playing Monster Hunter without me. <laughs> you were busy. <laughs> they're playing it without me for a while, dude. It was dope as hell, dude. Busy. I, 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 man, I, I love Monster Hunter World. <laughs> It's very if good. It, if it wasn't like 2 a.m. right now, I would play Monster mm. Hunter with yeah. you later. <laughs> um, I'm also excited for um, the new 3D world like port that they're doing to the Switch. Uh, purely oh, just because yeah. like there's online multiplayer 
which oh, yeah. to yeah, me yeah, is big, absolutely the worth the price of admission. That sounds if, that sounds yeah, hilarious. If, if Nintendo starts doing like online multiplayer for like their releases like that, I think that that would be just, fucking insane. And plus, that would that be old? awesome. The only thing I want is for it to be. Yeah, good. that's that's my big concern. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. So Super Mario 3D World for the we released originally on the Wii U. They're porting it to the Switch mm. with online multiplayer and also like a new campaign called Bowser's Fury. Um, Ooh, interesting. It's it's a good game. It's just really solid. Is this one also going to be like one of those time no, exclusive things? No, it's like not going to be timed exclusive. Also, with with like speaking of like online multiplayer, I'm pretty sure next year is the 35th anniversary of Zelda, right? It I'm will be. really fucking hoping yeah. they actually do something for it. Mario was a was cool, but they a bit of a mess better. just because of everything going on. I would love Everything nothing fucking more to, to get finally get another free multiplayer Zelda port with online on the eShop. Whether it be four swords. If they make it or times adventures. like last time, I'd kill a man, I think. But it's it's free. <laughs> I yeah, I know, but I didn't I just didn't know that four swords. Oh god, was free but yeah, you're US, right. And if then they, it was if gone. they just shut off the servers at some point, that would suck. I don't know if I don't know if they shut off the servers or anything like that, but like it just wasn't on the eShop. Like, but one of my friends told me to. Yeah, get it, it just wasn't just, on the eShop anymore. But there. I mean, I'm saying if that they do it, so if they do another release and it's online, but they just remove your ability to play it, like essentially what they're doing with Mario Battle Royale, that would suck, Dick. And I can, I'll that's tell you what, stupid. right, right yeah, now, that's, that's my prediction. Mm-hmm. They're gonna release a dope as hell Zelda Four Swords or Four Swords Adventure port. Nintendo Switch Online members downloaded for free, and it's going to be gone by the end of the year. That's my prediction. <laughs> yeah, that would that would be so annoying. That would be so Nintendo. God, they they really grind my goose with some of the stuff they mm. do. Oh, Elden Ring. Do you think we'll see anything about that? <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, we're not going. That that's one of the games that I was looking forward to. Actually, I'm, that, I'll, that game's going to get. Improved. If we get like just some guy talking about some of these games that are coming out mm-hmm. i doubt elden ring will get any information until like three months before gotcha. it's released so uh yeah. i i just had two games that i was looking forward to and um don't need much talk about them uh, i just want to mention them it is uh death loop another mm-hmm. yep. uh oh. new ip from arcane mm-hmm. studio which seems fantastic yeah. um i heavily suggest any game by those guys and then uh a game that just looks cool uh and uh I'm a I'm a stickler for games that look cool. Uh, Ghostwire Tokyo. Oh yeah, mm. it, it, I've heard of it. it. It looks like um, it looks like a game that's probably going to be as, about as good as Ghost of Tsushima. Um, and Ghost of Tsushima is pretty fantastic. It's not like, it's not like a a war yeah, trend revolutionary. Game it's just good. I, I don't know. I feel like it might have been on my list if I had picked it up and played it, but I haven't it, gotten to it. Yeah, that's fair. That is totally not saying it's bad yeah. in any way. It's well, like yeah. by definition a mm. good game. Um but Ghostwire Tokyo gives me sort of sort of the same vibes. And also it's it's sort of like uh it seems like an interesting look into sort of Japanese yeah. horror. Um, Which I, I am personally and that's a huge fan of. And by Japanese horror I mean Yokai Watch, but Mm. <laughs> that, I was gonna say I was gonna actually um, make that comparison. I was gonna say this seems like uh, watch, but for a big uh, it boys. seems like uh, uh, yeah, and a neat way to get into like um, uh, the sort of Japanese I, yokais like yokai watch, except without all the um, yeah, kittiness. You know, Not the butthead guy. <laughs> oh man, love that series. Hey, you know what I'm most looking forward to? Let's see a yokai watch four point port point. Can we get a point? Oh point. It's oh, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah I'm if you're talking about that, I'm looking any news about a new Ace Attorney whatsoever. Mm. Yeah, I want to. Oh I want a Mother God. Three port. Uh, I, don't I don't think, think that's, that's gonna happen. Uh, neither will Yokai Watch Four. I don't know why it hasn't happened. They could have easily just dropped that, like with the uh, SNES games. Because Nintendo or, didn't wait, do it originally, oh, and oh, they wait, think it's too funny to do it now. Actually? Yeah. Okay. If they ever do Game Boy Advance Virtual Console, they could easily just drop it with that. We got Fire Emblem, the first one, completely localized yeah. and ported. I could totally see them just kinda dropping sad, some shit like kinda that. Kind of sad cool. we didn't get SMT. But... Yeah. Also, isn't it only like $7? Yeah, I, I picked it up just because I, I don't want to, or uh, I, I kind of want to see if it's any good. 
fantastic. Yeah, we also got the one, um, like, I, I don't know, it's like Secrets of Mana Trial and Mana, like, one of those games yeah, that, like, actually yeah. got localized. Mm-hmm. That's fair, though. I think that's um, it's all the ideas I have. I'm ready to wrap up when everyone else is. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's going to be it for us. Uh, thanks for tuning in and listening to us ramble on for so long. If you're interested, I think this probably won't be the last time we all get together and talk about games, but probably not for this long and not in this format. So uh, I guess yeah, I, I would hope not. I was actually looking back at it. There are a shit ton of games in 2019 that I absolutely adore, though. Um, very disappointing. Uh, I really wanted to talk about Blasphemous, which is a great game, but I never had. Uh, but it came out 2019, so I didn't want to talk yeah. about it here. Perhaps in the future we can talk about it. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be reviewing stuff. So yeah, if you're if you uh, liked what you listened to, I guess keep an eye on the channel for more. Yeah. All right. Lick and subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> bless Mugabe. See you later. God bless Mugabe. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>